Good afternoon and welcome everybody to this uh, last installment of the CCAM Mixed Gen series. So we've come full circle. We started this series a few months ago with a lecture on activated events and we're going to end it today uh, on the same broad topic, but I think with a different and complementary point of view. We are very excited to have with us Alessandro Laio as our experienced speaker who will uh, get us started and his presentation will be followed by the presentations of three today, not two, but three uh, younger colleagues that should turn on their cameras so that we can all see their faces and welcome them as well to this session. So before we get started, I am not going to steal um, a long time from you, but I wanted to share some information that I'm going to do by first of all, sharing my screen and the PowerPoint presentation. Here we go. So um, we've been playing with this new format here at CCAM to try to bring together uh, the community and in particular to offer younger participants, PhD students and young postdocs who are going through very important years of their life under very difficult circumstances because with the pandemics, as we all know, the opportunities for travel, for attending workshops, for attending schools, uh, for getting in touch with uh, the leading experts in their own field and, and get input and discuss their work. Uh, all these things suffer because of the current conditions. So we've tried to provide a forum to at least mitigate in part um, the consequences of the situation or not while we wait to go back to, to happier times in which we can you know, all be in the same room and drink coffee and have beautiful scientific fights in front of blackboards. Um, and, and we are very, very proud and happy uh, of the response that we've had. So thank you all for helping us uh, making this uh, a successful experience, we think. But as always uh, with CCAM activities, we try to also get feedback to understand how we can improve on the type of things that we do. And so, and here comes the threat and the price that you have to pay for attending this type of events. You will receive an email on Monday and this email will contain a link to a survey. It shouldn't take more than five to 10 minutes to, to fill it, probably even less than that. But you know, there are a few questions in which we ask you uh, to tell us how we did and uh, invite you to suggest improvements or even you know, possible topics for the second series of the mixed gen uh, events for SICAM. Because um, we think that this has worked well. We've had interesting and very positive feedback from the people that we have spoken with. And so the idea is to plan a second series of webinars for the fall and possibly also for the spring semester next year. Now, we all hope that the situation will have improved to the point you know, to which you know, the limitations that we are experiencing will have lessened, but we still think that this forum does provide a useful opportunity for young people to present their work to a broad audience. It will also enable people from you know, different continents to get together. Um, we think that the gather sessions are, are a nice opportunity for informal interactions. So we're working to see uh, how much of this experiment we can replicate in the fall. So that's coming. Uh, we are also working to maintain our program of alternative format uh, webinars. And, and these will probably include both the Sika Marvel Classics lectures in simulations and modeling, in which we invite originators of methods that have become you know, standard tools in our community to guide us through these methods and through you know, a little bit of the history that led them to come up with the ideas that we now all use. We've had four fantastic sets of speakers in the four uh, initial lectures for this series, Chicotti and Ricard on constraints, Karen Parinello on Karen Parinello molecular dynamics, Vanderbilt and Resta on polarization methods in Abinicio MD, and most recently, uh, Dan Frankel and Tony Ladd on methods for computing free energy in solids. And then we're also going to start or restart our Mary and Men's side conversation series. These are lectures that usually tackle topics that are somewhat near, but not at the core of our day-to-day -day business. 
And we try to invite speakers who can bring in experiences that are different uh, from the ones that we are familiar with and help us understand you know, collateral efforts or alternative career paths for people who are in the world of modeling and simulation. I mean, we had um, speakers from industry, we had Mary Edmund Seidt, after whom this series is named, and she is one of the first women coders in the world of molecular dynamics. So that gives you a little bit the idea of the breadth and things that we do. So in short, stay tuned. Uh, we hope to bring you uh, interesting activities online or in hybrid format in, in the fall and spring uh, next year. You can keep up to speed with our initiatives by registering uh, to our mailing list. In order to do that, you go to one of the pages of the lectures or of this mixed gen series, you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page and you will see that there is a little window that you can fill to enroll in the mailing list. You can also follow us on Twitter, CCAM events, and uh, Odd, who's our uh, event coordinator, is uh, very good at uh, uh, sharing news about things that we try to come up with. So that's the announcement. I also have a little bit of a duty to take you through a few points before we start with the fun part, with the science part of this uh, session. First of all, note that this meeting is recorded. And the reason why we are doing this is because we are going to upload it on the uh, CCAM YouTube channel and on the CCAM website after the end of the session so that you can catch up with us if you, uh, you know, have to somehow go away or be distracted during this, uh, this first talk. Now, we have uh, two sets of talk. Uh, Alessandro Laio will start with uh, an introduction and uh, an in-depth talk on the topic of estimating the free energy from enhanced sampling to manifold learning. This is um, quite a long talk. And so we have decided to handle questions in the following way. Uh, you will be... Uh, able, and in fact, we invite you to ask questions during Alessandro's talk. To do that, please use the Q&A tool in the Zoom. And uh, for questions during the talk, I will be in charge of repeating them to Alessandro. The reason why we do this is because we would like to try to minimize the interruptions of the flow during the, the presentation. At the end of the talk, instead, you will be able to ask questions directly. So for the first set of questions, please type the question in the Q&A and I will repeat the question to Alessandro. At the end of the talk, just signal on the Q&A that you want to ask a question, and we will give you the possibility to ask that question in person. To do so, you will receive a notification to unmute yourself uh, while Alessandro answers the, the question before the one that you want to ask. And, um, and then when your turn comes, you just unmute yourself and you ask the question directly. So, um, so that's for the first talk. For the three talks given by the junior speakers today, uh, we will not uh, ask, we, we ask you not to ask questions during the talk. These are shorter presentations. And so we feel that you can just uh, ask all your questions at the end. And the process is the same as for Alessandro at the end of the talk. So just signal in the Q&A that you want to ask a question. You will be invited to unmute and you will have an opportunity to um, ask the question directly. You will not be able to activate your video for the whole duration of your Zoom session. So even when you're asking a question, only the mute and unmute will work. And the chat feature on this Zoom session has been deactivated for you as participants. Um, this is really all I wanted to say, except for the fact that the format for today's session is unusual in the fact that we have four talks instead of three, as we usually do. And it is also uh, unusual or, or uh, more in the spirit of sharing than, than usual, in the sense that this is a session that will be co-chaired by myself and Ignacio. I will be in charge of the first three talks, and then Ignacio will uh, take us to the end of the meeting and say a few words before we uh, say goodbye for the time being. Okay, that's really all I had to tell you. I think we are now ready for the first talk of this afternoon, and this is Alessandro Laio, estimating the free energy from enhanced sampling to manifold learning. Alessandro, the floor, the floor is yours, thank you. And you have to un unmute yourself. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen. Yeah. Yes, everything seems to be working. Wait a second. Yeah. 
uh, move this thing. Okay, so, uh, well, first of all, I would like really to thank very much uh, uh, Sara and Ignacio for giving me this fantastic opportunity to speak to all of you. I have seen in the list of participants so many, many names of friends, which uh, unfortunately I haven't seen in the next, in the, in the last month, and that I would really love to uh, see you all by person. And I hope this is going to be possible very, very soon. Okay, so uh, my talk will be about, uh, well, about free energies. Uh, so the general, uh, the general, so the, the, the main reason behind uh, everything that I have been doing for the last, uh, well, 20 years or so is always been to, uh, well, develop, uh, uh, develop tools, which in a way allow using uh, molecular dynamics to uh, obtain realistic prediction on uh, uh, atomistic and molecular systems. Uh, so the uh, story which uh, uh, I will talk about today is, is a very, very entangled story. Uh, it's the story of a, a strong entanglement between uh, uh, many different uh, topics. Hmm? The, here I have listed these topics, uh, the free energy, hardware and software uh, development, metastability and unsampling. All of these uh, topics are, uh, well, cannot be really uh, discussed, uh, in my opinion, without taking into account uh, the others. Okay, so let's start about metastability. So in uh, molecular dynamics, simulation of uh, chemical reaction and phase transitions, uh, uh, well, the system spends most of the time oscillating in uh, uh, local minima. This is something which is uh, well known and only rarely it performs a jump to another state. Hmm? Uh, the time required to perform the jump is, is short. So this is the, let's say, quasi technical definition of uh, metastability. So metastability is present in uh, uh, many systems we are interested in. Uh, well, these numbers which I have listed below these examples are the waiting time, the time that you typically have to wait before observing an event. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they go from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, picoseconds in some very fast chemical reaction to something which is uh, uh, above the age of the universe in some uh, special phase transitions. Uh, okay, so in our uh, uh, molecular dynamic world, uh, the, a key uh, issue that one has to address in order to st uh, study metastability in a specific system is, uh, in a way, uh, representing in an understandable and uh, uh, interpretable manner uh, what, uh, in a specific system, this uh, metastability means. Hmm? This implies choosing what we call a collective variable. Hmm? So this thing is well, basically done, let's say, uh, in the traditional manner by giving a close look to the system. And then uh, what is a collective variable? One should find a function of the co coordinate, which uh, gives, uh, takes very different values in different states uh, of the system, hmm? the so-called metastable states of the system. Okay, so these are the three examples that I had on my screen below. So, for example, if one wants to study a phase transition, a good collective variable is the box shape, which is typically defined by six coordinates. Here, if one wants to study a chemical reaction, uh, well, uh, the collective variable is once again multidimensional, typically, and involves using uh, the bonding pattern. Uh, well, if I want to study protein folding, then I have uh, yeah, many different choices, like the fraction of alpha helix, the number of contacts. Hmm? Uh, okay, so here, how should a good collective variable behave as a function of time uh, in a typically metastable system? 
So, well, in a metastable system, as I said, uh, is a system which, per, which is typically in one state and only rarely performs a jump to another state. No? So the typical behavior of a collective variable should be like this, where this is the time before the reaction, which is typically long. And then I have the reaction time, which is typically very, very short. Here, if I would actually zoom in this uh, vertical uh, line here, I would see that the reaction time is not uh, instantaneous, but it is uh, orders and orders of magnitude shorter than the time that you have to wait before observing your reaction. Uh, so here, uh, in order to represent in a graphical manner what is actually going on in a trajectory like the one that I have depicted before, uh, the key tool is uh, uh, the free energy. Hmm? Uh, why? Uh, what is the free energy? So let's start again from a trajectory like the one that we have seen. So here, one, for example, in a trajectory like that, one uh, can compute the probability density, which is basically making the histogram of this collective variable. And in this case, I get uh, two probability peaks, right? Two very well separated probability peaks. And then, so here, in general, by definition of the fact that my system is metastable, the probability of observing the system in the transition region will be exponentially small. Since it is exponentially small, it is customary uh, that instead of, uh, uh, of uh, um, taking, instead of taking, uh, uh, of looking at the probability density, one looks at the logarithm of the probability density, which is ex exactly what we call the free energy, which in this case, uh, will, I will have a free energy with two minima, one corresponding to this state and the other corresponding to this state here. Hmm? Here, it, since it's a logarithmic scale, basically in what uh, is basically not possible to see in a probability density plot becomes visible in a free energy representation, namely how the barrier region looks uh, like. Okay, uh, so here, since uh, uh, the, free the free energy is extremely popular as uh, a visualization engine hmm, before anything else. So I'm going to show you some free energy landscapes, which, uh, um, well, I have found through the literature, of course, there are many more. Here, for example, this is uh, uh, yeah, from uh, uh, Michele Vendruscolo's group. Here, what it is very important to notice in these graphs is that uh, in every, in each of these different graphs, which I will show, the coordinates are different. Here, I have a sketch map projection one, sketch map projection two. Here, receptor conformation, G protein state. Here I have uh, umbrella sampling coordinate in IC2. Here I have uh, uh, S path and Z path, which are uh, collective variable for the path. No? So basically, uh, well, more or less, uh, all of us, uh, and well, include in our publication a graph where we have a free energy, which can be typically one, two, or three dimensional. And then these free energies are represented as a function of collective variables, which are typically different uh, in different articles. No? So the, I use uh, one type of collective variable. I, I don't know. Uh, Frank Noé will use another type of variables and so on and so forth. Hmm? OK. Well, this, uh, in a way, brings me immediately to the next uh, uh, point uh, in our entangled business. Well, finding the right collective variable is not a challenge, but uh, one can almost say that is the challenge. Hmm? So here, uh, why? Because uh, uh, molecular systems, uh, uh, in general, are very high dimensional. In general, they have a very high dimensional probability distribution. And by choosing a collective variable, since I, I have to do a graph on my paper, this unavoidably implies uh, uh, projecting a multidimensional probability distribution into a low dimensional space, right? So here, well, here, making a projection for 100,000 dimensions to two dimensions 
is typically very difficult. It is then difficult if I have to project from two dimension to one dimension. So let's, let's consider this uh, um, uh, toy two dimensional landscape where I have five minima. Hmm? Now let's say that I want to do a one dimensional projection of this uh, uh, toy system. So if I project it in a long X, I will get this graph. If I project it along Y, I will get uh, this graph. Hmm? So these uh, free energies, which I obtained by this one dimensional projection are, well, let's say almost flat, even if my two dimensional free energy landscape is uh, far from flat, right? Hmm? So here in this specific case, one dimensional projection, well, they are thermodynamically meaningful. Well, this is true by definition because these are just the logarithm of the one dimensional probability density, but of course are not very insightful, right? So even in, if I do a, a, a simple projection from two to one dimension, I am immediately in troubles. Uh, well, so, so a good collective variable should at least be able to distinguish all the metastable states, no? So like if I have only two metastable states, if I take this collective variable, then my free energy will look like that, and this is bad. If instead I take this collective variable, my free energy will look like that, and this is good. Hmm? Trivial. What it is a little bit uh, less trivial is that a, a, a variable capable of distinguishing two state is not necessarily a good one, right? So here, actually, uh, actually, um, so in the last uh, 20 or so years, there were important breakthrough in understanding exactly this concept, which is now a key concept. And here I have stolen a graph from this uh, article, which is one of the article which uh, contributed to uh, clear uh, the light on this very important point. Here I have uh, two, uh, two dimensional landscapes, which basically are characterized by the same free energy. No? This free energy here and this free energy here, they are basically the same. So both these collective variables, this one and this one, are perfectly able to distinguish A from B, but this is a good reaction coordinate. X is a good reaction coordinate in this case, and this B is a, while in this case, this is a bad reaction coordinate. Hmm? Why? Well, because in this case, if I am on the barrier, I shoot with half probability on this side and half probability on this side. If I am on this barrier here, I shoot either on this side if I am here or on this side if I am here, right? So this concept has been introduced in several papers. Uh, well, this is probably the most famous where uh, they, this group of people which you see here introduced a very powerful approach which basically allows to uh, understand if a collective variable is good for describing kinetics or not. So this tool is called the transition path sampling and then several other people contributed to this developing very important concepts like the concept of the committor and other important approach, which I want to mention is aimless shooting. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, it is nowadays possible uh, to parameterize functions which uh, accurately predict if a specific configuration is committed to A or committed to B, and this function, which is called the committor, is universally, I, I would say, considered as the perfect collective variable for describing uh, kinetics. Okay, so this is, uh, in a way, um, summarized in this uh, slide. Uh, and uh, so we are somehow ready to move to the next wire of our uh, entangled bundle. Hmm? So this next wire is uh, hardware and software development for molecular dynamics. 
So here one would say that uh, really uh, in this field, nothing really else, else matters because uh, uh, yeah, this is a famous uh, one, it is a famous graph in one of the many, many versions that are around on the web, which basically show that uh, the speed of uh, computers grows exponentially over time. Hmm? Here, uh, and so we have basically passed from, uh, well, we are, I'm talking about the simulation of proteins in 30 years, we have passed from simulations uh, which basically lasted 30 picoseconds to simulations which now uh, cover a time scale of uh, milliseconds. And it is now possible to physically see small proteins fold with basically no enhanced sampling uh, at all. Hmm? So this uh, breakthrough is uh, yeah, now almost 10 years old. It is mostly due to the work uh, performed in David Shaw group. Uh, well, here, um, on the other hand, if uh, we compare uh, the simulation of, uh, uh, see, if we really look at the number of the time scale we can uh, simulate nowadays, we see that uh, uh, there is still some way to go before we can really, really forget about, uh, uh, well, anything else and simply uh, simulate brute force our systems. No? So nowadays, uh, the, uh, what we can nowadays simulate in one month in classical molecular dynamics is basically one millisecond. Hmm? For David Show group, uh, let's say for people with ordinary computational resources, we have uh, we are uh, two orders of magnitude uh, below yet. Okay, so protein folding. Uh, well, we are in the ballpark for fast folding proteins, but not for proteins which fold uh, uh, on uh, a longer time. Phase transitions. Uh, Typically, we are not uh, yet uh, in the ballpark. Uh, the situation is even worse uh, if we want to simulate chemical reactions or like, for example, enzymatic reactions. Uh, in this case, uh, well, the time scale is, uh, uh, well, still orders of magnitude uh, above what uh, uh, can be simulated with uh, brute force. Well, however, as uh, basically everybody in this audience, uh, I think, know, it is possible to obtain, even with moderate computational resources, uh, information about uh, the behavior of the system on longer time scale. Here, uh, I am showing two examples. This, so this is a folding trajectory of a protein which falls on the time scale of uh, one second. It's a, uh, not a fast folder still it is possible to observe a folding event uh, with incredible detail. This is another example um, of a phase trans transition involving a zeolite. This is a, a slightly order, uh, slightly older example, actually not from 2010, but even a little bit before showing that uh, uh, yeah, it is actually possible to observe this tra transition, which uh, would really not happen on, uh, 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 on the time scale, which you can simulate on a computer. OK, um, so here the key player in this business is uh, our enhanced sampling technique. The key trick in common to all of these technique is uh, concentrating the uh, simulation effort on simulating the reaction time, namely this extremely short vertical line that we see here. Hmm? So this can be done in many different manners. One can pull the collective variable. If I have a single collective variable, this you can do it, uh, well, with thermodynamic integration, which is the oldest uh, and unsampling technique. You can do it with steered molecular dynamics. You can do important sampling on reactive trajectory, which is something which I have already mentioned. 
or you can do it by flattening the free energy. Here, the uh, prototype of this approach is umbrella sampling. We will talk about this thing in a second. And then you can do it by rising the temperature of the collective variable of the solute or of all the system. This you can do it with the temperature accelerated molecular dynamics, solute temper per in replica exchange method. Uh, so here I will say a few words about uh, flattening the free energy. So this is the dynamic of the system if uh, under the action of the uh, normal uh, potential. This dynamic is characterized by metastability, as we have seen. Now I add an external bias of this form. And then I basically get this trajectory. No? So here in this trajectory, basically I go several times back and forth between reactants and products. And so I am actually able to do what I have promised. Namely, I uh, concentrate my simulation time in simulating only the job. Okay, so here this thing can be done in many manners. One of the possible manner of doing that is uh, metadynamics, where you basically uh, iteratively build a bias which uh, uh, compensates the underlying free energy. So in metadynamics, like in uh, many others of the approach which I mentioned, you have to choose a collective variable. So in this example is just the X variable. And then you bias the dynamics with an history dependent potential, which is basically a sum of Gaussians. And then, uh, well, basically for large time, the free energy, so the bias is an approximation of the free energy. So here there are many other methods which came out before hours and some even after hours, which are basically uh, based on similar ideas. Well, I want to mention taboo search, local elevation, adaptive force bias, and Wang and Landau sampling. So now, uh, well, uh, what uh, uh, so an unsampling is strongly related with the, the problem of choosing the right collective variable, the correct collective variable. If the collective variable that you choose is not good, in metadynamics you get. Uh, what we call hysteresis. So while in the previous example, the sum of the free energy plus the bias potential was something which was basically flat, here in this case where the collective variable that we choose, the X, is not good, the sum of the free energy plus the bias potential is not flat. Here, as you can see, here is only uh, well, here is not flat uh, now. Hmm? Now the system performs a, by chance a transition in the transverse direction, and then it becomes transiently flat, but you never know when the sum of your free energy plus your bias potential is flat. Hmm? So as a matter of fact, obtaining a converged free energy using the wrong collective variable is basically hopeless. Hmm? It's not difficult, it's just well, I would say hopeless. Uh, well, this thing is in common to basically any free energy method. So this is true for thermodynamic integration. It's true for, uh, well, one. It's true for any method that you can imagine. No, in basically any free energy method, if you don't use the correct collective variable, obtaining a converged free energy is well, basically as difficult as running an unbiased molecular dynamics, but fortunately you can normally find out pretty easily if uh, your collective variable is correct or not. Hmm? You do normally do it by a trivial error estimate. Hmm? So in metadynamics, uh, you basically compute the standard deviation of uh, your bias potential. Hmm? If your standard deviation of your bias potential is small, then your collective variable is good. Hmm? Okay, so how do you, uh, well, how do you actually, what can you do in order to choose the collect, correct collective variables? Well, uh, a possible way out, which has been considered uh, a lot in the literature is 
biasing simultaneously many collective variables. No, because of course, if you can bias many collective variables simultaneously, there are less chances that the good collective variable is among the set that you are biasing. So here, well, this is a particularly important, for example, in protein foldings, where if you don't use as a collective variable the root mean square deviation from the folded state, well, there are actually really many, many possible collective variables which uh, you can consider the, as uh, good collective variables to bias. Hmm? Okay, so here now, uh, well, uh, according to the method that you are using, uh, there are different limitations uh, on the number of collective variables which you can bias. So let's say in thermodynamic integration and steel molecular dynamics, typically, you can bias one collective variable. In parallel tempering, solute tempering, basically, well, you also somehow bias a single collective variable, which, well, let's say in parallel tempering is just the potential energy. In WAM, typically, you use two collective variables, even if there are uh, cases in one where people have uh, actually also biased uh, three or more collective variables, but let's say typically you use two. In metadynamics, standard metadynamics and well-tempered metadynamics, typically you bias three collective variables, even if there are heroic attempts to bias uh, more collective variables up to six, to the best of my knowledge. No? So the reason why you cannot bias simultaneously more than three collective variables is that, let's say in metadynamics, for example, the filling speed uh, decreases exponentially with the, the dimensionality of the free energy. Hmm? So this poses, let's say, a hard limit in the number of variables which you can bias simultaneously. Okay, so here going for a moment out, out of the metadynamics world, uh, so there is a different manner, a different way to go to bias simultaneously many Bro, collective sorry to, variables. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but before you move out of the metadynamics world, we have a question from Miroslav Surzon, mm -hmm. who would like to thank you for a very interesting talk. And then he asks, is the observed hysteresis during a suboptimal, using a suboptimal CV due to kinetic trapping of slower degrees of freedom? Well, due to transverse degrees of freedom. So look at this case. So this is a typical example of hysteresis because in fact, uh, my, uh, my, the sum of the free energy plus the bias is, is not a flat line. Why? Because here I have a, 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 I have a transverse degree of freedom, which is Y, which is not biased at all. So along X, I am forcing transitions by metadynamics. Along Y, the transition happen only due to thermal fluctuations. And this is what causes hysteresis. All right. Then, of course, I can, if this uh, reply is not sufficient, I can actually, uh, well, actually uh, comment more upon that uh, uh, by a direct way. So here, a, a very, very interesting and fruitful idea which came out in the literature several times uh, is the idea of uh, biasing several collective variables simultaneously by imposing adiabatic separation between the collective variables and the rest of the variables and keeping the collective variables simultaneously at a high temperature. So this thing came out first, uh, I think in 2002 uh, by Jos van de Bondel, the Ursula Reutlisberger and uh, simultaneously by Mark Tuckerman. And then a few years later by Eric van den Eyden who worked on a similar idea. So this thing is very fruitful and uh, a very powerful way to go. In, uh, um, let's say in the metadynamics world, a possible manner to bias more than three collective variable is uh, uh, by the method which is called bias exchange, which I'm going to describe uh, shortly. So here it's uh, basically a, a, a cartoon illustrating what happens in bias exchange exactly 
on the two-dimensional system that I used as an example for hysteresis in, well, a few slides ago. Here, here I have two metadynamics, one run, one biasing X, the other biasing Y. If these two metadynamics were run independently, then I would have a hysteresis on both, right? But now what I am doing is the following, is that from time to time, basically I attempt swapping the coordinates between the two replicas and I accept the probability. So the move, the swapping move with the probability, which is basically this one. So basically by, by allowing this swap move, I kill hysteresis in this case. I kill hysteresis. So this thing basically allows the, well, let's say a parallel reconstruction of the free energy in a virtually unlimited number of collective variables. Well, the accuracy of each free energy estimate is greatly enhanced by the jumps in collective variable space due to the exchanges. So this thing is basically an approach which uh, allowed computing free energies in more than three dimensions using metadynamics. Of course, we had to solve a very, very important key problem. The key problem is that this approach doesn't give you the free energy in, uh, let's say, six dimensions, but gives you six one-dimensional free energies. So you have to pass from six one-dimensional free energies to a six-dimensional free energy. And this you will be, we will basically doing it by combining, uh, by reweighting, by combining different free energy measures on different replicas in using a one-like approach. So this thing, uh, well, basically allowed us uh, uh, to compute free energies in many dimensions by using this approach. So, well, this uh, approach uh, along the years allowed us to estimate free energy landscapes of systems which was possible to treat only using several collective variables at the same time. For example, here, this is the landscape for the, for the uh, nucleation of an aggregate of uh, small peptides. And this is the free energy landscape of the GB3 proteins. Hmm? Here, uh, well, this is a three-dimensional landscape because, uh, of course, one can only visualize three-dimensional landscape, but actually, the free energy we computed in this case is uh, six dimensional. And this is the same stuff for an intrinsically disordered uh, protein. Once again, in this case, it was necessary to use uh, eight uh, collective variables. All right, so this uh, um, uh, landscape uh, of an intrinsically disordered uh, protein actually brings me to the uh, second part of my talk, which I uh, colloquially called uh, intrinsically unreadable free energy landscape. Hmm? What is an intrinsically unreadable free energy landscape? Uh, well, uh, so this thing uh, is, uh, um, uh, so this word unreadable is actually motivated by a simulation which I performed, uh, uh, well, a, a, a a project which I performed, or, well, now a few years ago, which involved sampling by bias exchange metadynamics, the configurational space of a polyvaline of length 60. So these are the configurations which are explored in this run. Will be basically, these configurations are basically 5,000, approximately 5,000 different uh, conformations. Basically in this single run, we basically observe uh, all the known protein structures of that size. Mm -hmm. So clearly when you are dealing with 5,000 conformations, so these are by far too many to be visualized in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. 
So this specific uh, problem motivated me and my group to move, uh, well, to search for other manners for understanding and visualizing free energy landscape that were going a little bit beyond normal collective variables. Hmm? So this thing is clearly not something which uh, I discovered or anybody in my group discovered. This is something which kept uh, busy the community for many years. And there are many very, very important attempts in this dimension, in this direction. Here I am, uh, well, uh, spotlighting on a few of these attempts. Well, one very important from Mark Tuckerman and in his group. Uh, which was actually aimed at visualizing multi, well, understanding the features of a multidimensional free energy landscape. Another one very, very important, which is also based on machine learning, like things that I'm doing is the sketch map approach by Michele Ceriotti, Tribello, and Michele Parinello. And possibly the most important thing is Markov state modeling, which is something which I think everybody knows and uh, uh, which basically is, I would say, the key tool for uh, looking at uh, large molecular dynamic simulation. So this is a tool which in general can be used uh, even without knowing the collective variable, let's say. It allows understanding what are the metastable states of the system by using, of course, kinetic information. Here uh, we are, uh, okay, but uh, now, uh, so here in our, in our uh, so the manner on, in which I am approaching this problem uh, is actually uh, by using a, another player, which is machine learning, which is a very popular player nowadays among uh, many of us. Many of us are actually moving to that. Many people would say that uh, using machine learning uh, actually does not uh, really untie the bundle, rather puts uh, like underwear on uh, the bundle. It's something that, uh, yeah, in a way allows you not to see any more the bundle. I'm, yeah, well, not fully convinced uh, about that, but uh, uh, still that's what many, many people believe. Okay, so let's uh, try to see what uh, this censoring actually means and how we do this censoring in a specific case. So here, if one wants to use uh, machine learning uh, to uh, understand how a free energy landscape looks like, one has to face a, a critical difficulty. This critical difficulty is uh, projection. So this is the difficulty which we have already mentioned. So we want to address this difficulty by, uh, well, without choosing the collective variables. Okay, so let's say the master tool in this business is uh, principal component analysis. So if I have a two-dimensional data landscape looking like that, if I diagonalize the covariance matrix, I will discover that I can describe it basically with no information loss, by using a principal component analysis. And I will discover that I will have to use only this uh, variable here. Hmm? OK, great. So what happens if the, my embedding manifold, my data con embedding manifold containing the data is curved, like in this case? Well, then uh, here, principal component analysis in general will not give me the right coordinate, I will not be able to, uh, my covariance matrix uh, will not, uh, the eigenvalues of my covariance matrix will not have a, a gap after one variable, but I can use uh, many other tools which were developed, some in uh, machine learning like kernel principal component analysis, other in uh, a molecular dynamics uh, world like sketch map, which I have already mentioned, and uh, a, well, diffusion map. But other very important tools are local linear embedding and isomap. In all of these cases, basically what you are actually doing is taking your data manifold, which is in general curved and twisted, and then you iron it into a beautiful hyperplane. 
So this is strictly speaking, not uh, rigorously true, neither for sketch map nor for kernel PCA, but uh, it is uh, true for local linear embedding and isomap, rigorously speaking. Okay, but uh, well, here, uh, what would it happen in a foam-like embedding manifold, like this one, where your molecular configurations actually lie here on the edges of this thing? So here, this is, uh, let's say, locally uh, approximately one-dimensional, but of course, we can not map this uh, into a line, right? So here, if I, I, you want to have a, a pretty pessimistic perspective on uh, real-world data, and in particular on uh, data from the molecular world, one could say that uh, uh, data in real world are typically embedded on curved and twisted hypersurfaces with complex topo topologies, not topographies, complex topologies, which means that they are not isomorphic to hyperplanes, not necessarily at least. And moreover, the local dimension of these uh, uh, regions uh, which are basically the sides uh, of the foam bubbles are not one dimensional, but are typically high dimensional. They can be 10 dimensional or more. Hmm? So, uh, well, so basically my work in the last few years has actually been devoted to developing tools which allow you to tackle this situation. Needless to say that uh, I haven't found what can be called the general solution. I have only made a few uh, small steps in that direction, which actually uh, are complementary to other things that uh, many other people have done independently. But actually, let's try to see what happens if I try to do a two-dimensional projection of a molecular dynamics trajectory using a very famous machine learning tool, which is called, uh, which is called Isomap. Isomap actually is doing what I have actually told you. Take a, a curved manifold and iron it into an hyperplane. So here I am trying to apply this method on a molecular dynamic trajectory of the folding of a small protein from the D show group. So this is a trajectory in which the system got backward and forward from folded to unfolded state 15 times independently. So it's a very, very nice trajectory. So if you try to apply this method to this system, you get this two-dimensional projection. Here the points are colored according to the fraction of native contacts you see that there is a high degree of mixture between unfolded and folded configurations with no clear gap in between. Here, well, in this specific case, mapping this landscape to D equal to does not allow distinguishing the folded state. At least we didn't manage to find a manner to distinguish it. Okay, so here, uh, well, this is actually in, in the next uh, slide is an outline of what I have been doing in my group uh, in the last uh, five years. These are tools which allow, in a way, learning something about the structure of uh, the embedding manifold. Even if these tools were developed with an eye on molecular dynamics, they are actually tools which can also be used in general for doing uh, generically data analysis. Uh, so, well, actually, uh, so the tools which we have developed uh, allow computing the dimension of the manifold containing the data, which we call the embedding manifold. Then the second uh, key passage on which I'm going to spend some time in the next uh, 10 minutes is estimating the free energy of each data point. And then, finding the free energy minima by using uh, density peak clustering, and then doing something very similar to what uh, I have already mentioned, the work by uh, Mark Tuckerman, 
well, namely studying the topography of the manifold, find the set all point, and uh, basically represent the uh, topography of this landscape. Okay, now- uh, Sorry to interrupt you again, but before you dive into this, we have a question from Karsten Hartmann, which I think pertains to the foam-like structures and how they appear. He says, I thought that the standard assumption of conformational dynamics, especially of large molecules, is that the dynamics concentrates on a low dimensional manifold. So are you saying that this is not true or not always I, true? I say that this is definitely true, but what does low mean? Low means uh, like, for example, in the case, uh, as I'm, we are going to see in 10 minutes, in the case of uh, uh, building folding, the intrinsic dimension of the embedding manifold is 10. 10 is small because 10 is much smaller than the total number of relevant degrees of freedom, even of the protein. All right. Uh, okay, so here, um, estimate the entry is, so 10 is not two. That's what I want to say. It's not two and it's not one. Okay, now, uh, well, uh, one of the, so the, the key ingredients of what we are doing is uh, estimating the intrinsic dimension of the data set. Here, I don't want to spend time on telling you how, how we are doing that. I only want to say that what I call the intrinsic dimension is the minimum number of parameters required to describe the data uh, with the minimum information loss. Here, I only want to say that there are many, many methods in the literature which allow you to do that with different levels of uh, uh, precision. We have our own method, which I don't want to describe here. What instead, where I want to lose a little bit of time because it's somehow even related with the question which was just raised, is that the intrinsic dimension, in, especially in the molecular world, but in general, in data science, should always be considered as a, a function of the scale. So for example, in a sample of, in a molecular dynamic run of a, mo a biomolecule with an atoms with no constraints, of n bonds, in principle, explores a, a data manifold which has a dimension 3n minus six. Let's say six are just rotations and uh, translations. Not here if I don't have any constraints. Hmm? So, but clearly this estimate is irrelevant, right? Why is it irrelevant? Uh, because uh, actually what we call the intrinsic dimension is the number of linearly independent direction in which the system can move significantly. Hmm? So what does it mean significantly? Well, this means, so this of course depends on the scale, right? So here, here on uh, this simple example, on the small scale, the dimension is two, but on the intermediate scale, the dimension is one. And then on an even larger scale, the dimension becomes uh, two again. Hmm? So here, uh, so here, this means that uh, before performing uh, an analysis on a molecular system is always essential computing the intrinsic dimension, which is never a, a number which is true at any scale, but this intrinsic dimension is always something which depends on the scale. Hmm? And then if you are lucky, you have a range of scales in which your intrinsic dimension is at least approximately scale independent. And this is the region where you can do your analysis. Okay, now let me move to, uh, well, another key ingredient of what we are doing, which is estimating the free energy of each data point directly on the embedding manifold. Namely, without specifying the collective variables explicitly. So our manner of doing the things is based on the k nearest neighbor estimator, which uh, well is a very very simple approach for estimating the density. So here, if, for example, if I want to estimate the probability density around the red point, I fix the value of k to thirteen. And then basically what I do, I simply count, I estimate the volume of the 
hypersphere of radius equal to the distance between the rate point and its 13th neighbor. Hmm? So here, the intrinsic dimension is this number two that enters here. If I don't know this number two, I am actually not able to estimate this density. Hmm? And then from that, I get uh, the free energy, which is just the logarithm of this uh, density. But now we have a very, very important uh, problem, which is the fact that, they, especially in the molecular world, densities are highly non-uniform because the system we are interested in are metastable. So density varies by orders of magnitude. So therefore, since the density is highly non-uniform, in principle, in different regions of my configuration space, I would need a different value of k. If I take a single value of k for each data point, then I am introducing well, systematic errors or statistical errors. So this is actually a very well-known problem. When I want to estimate my density, I have to find a compromise between, uh, let's, let's say, a big variance, which I have for small k, and big bias, which means big systematic error, which I have for large k. So I have to find the compromise. There are different manners of finding this compromise, which were introduced in the literature. Our approach is specifically targeted for, uh, well, the molecular world and actually allows finding for each data point the optimal neighborhood for estimating, well, not really the density, but really the free energy. So basically the thing that we are doing is starting from a very small k, which actually ask if we should include the next neighbor in the density estimate. And basically we do it iteratively by a statistical approach, which compares the likelihood of uh, associated with the two different models. I have a model in which I assume that the density of this point and of this point is the same, and the model in which I, I instead assume that the diff density in this point, sorry, the free energy in this point and in this point is different. And basically, I stop where uh, this hypothesis can be rejected. So basically, this thing provides me automatically when I pass this confidence threshold for the optimal neighborhood size for estimating the density for this point. Here, uh, well, basically, the outcome of this procedure is a point-dependent estimate of the neighborhood uh, which I can use for estimating the density in each uh, point. So here, now I'm actually, this is the last thing that I'm going to show in this talk, is uh, what happens if I apply this method to an estimate of the free energy landscape of a building, the same system which we considered as an example for uh, isomap. Okay, so the uh, trajectory of this system is embedded in a manifold of intrinsic dimension 12. Mm -hmm. So this thing is something which uh, we find using uh, different uh, metrics. So the free energy landscape is a funnel. It's a funnel in 12 dimension, which looks like that. Uh, here I have the fraction of native contacts, and this is the free energy. Here, basically, there are no folding barriers in this uh, 12 dimensional space. Uh, no folding barriers at all. Hmm? So here one wonders if there are no folding barriers, where are the metastable states, right? Hmm? Uh, where are the free energy minima in this system? So the free energy minima in this system, well, here if I one tries to find the free energy minima, one finds free energy minima, one here, 
one here and one there, all corresponding to a large fraction of native contacts. Hmm? Well, no surprise, there is no minimum in the unfolded region. Well, no surprise because the unfolded state is not a free energy minimum in this uh, 12 dimensional space. Hmm? So what does this mean that the unfolded state is not metastable? Well, of course, uh, the answer is no. Hmm? So here, actually, uh, in order to understand this uh, apparent paradox, it's sufficient to think about a simple two-dimensional model like this one, where I have a, a very, very flat region, and then a tiny little well corresponding, well, in this case, to a pictorial folded state. Hmm? So here, if I compute the free energy as a function of the distance from this point, I get exactly this funnel-shaped free energy. And here I, of course, find a single free energy minimum, OK? Only one minimum. But finding this one minimum is a rare event. Hmm? So here, in a way, uh, so this raised uh, a challenge. And the challenge is how to find kinetic attractors, which are stabilized by conformational disorder, which actually mean this flat region here. How do you find these kinetic attractors? So basically, we use our free energy estimator. Well, our free energy estimator provides a point-dependent value of k, which is the number of neighbors around each point in which the free energy is approximately constant. So basically, this ki can be large, is actually large in two regions, is large close to the bottom of the well, the free energy minimum, where the density is high, but is also large in the flat region, because here the density is constant. So actually, here this is the plot of the value of k as a function of the distance from the minimum. As you can see, the value of k here is two maxima, one here and one there. OK, so this thing uh, uh, is basically uh, something which, by doing clustering, in which instead of uh, finding the minima of the free energy, we find the maxima of this k, we basically are able to find also metastable states in the unfolded region. Here I have our three cluster, which we found also before, plus two more clusters in the unfolded region. Uh, OK, so here the most populated cluster is the folded state. And we find two defective folded states and two unfolded states, not one unfolded state, two unfolded states. And the, the uh, surprise for us, because this was not uh, reported in the literature before, for this system, we find two unfolded states separated by a kinetic barrier, which is actually pretty significant. So the transition time between two un these two unfolded states is 280 nanoseconds. Hmm? So highly metastable uh, states, both disordered. OK, so here, uh, well, this approach allows, uh, well, to describe the kinetic uh, correctly. Here, I don't want to lose uh, time on that. Here, uh, well, this actually closes my presentation. Uh, well, basically, uh, I have illustrated what uh, uh, we are now able to do with our uh, approach for analyzing high dimensional free energy landscape. Uh, well, the free energy landscape of Wheeling is uh, normally considered readable because it's normally considered as a system with two states. Still, if you look at it uh, with this approach, uh, well, you find out uh, well something which is a posteriori pretty obvious. 
uh, that uh, the free energy landscape is uh, a funnel. Hmm? This is something which was actually was well known since uh, decades. But actually what we find is that we have an explicit characterization of what the funnel is, because uh, it's a funnel in this embedding manifold, which we define uh, as a function of the coordinates of uh, basically all the atoms of the protein. So we have five statistically meaningful kinetic attractors. Two of these kinetic attractors are unfolded. So we find metastability within the disordered state. Uh, well, basically this approach allows a full thermodynamics and kinetic description without using uh, collective variables. So we have uh, a description which is equivalent, uh, somehow equivalent to what you would obtain with Markov state modeling, but uh, without using any kinetic informations. So we only look at the probability density or the free energy of the system. So with this, I really want to go to my conclusions uh, very quickly. Uh, well, the few take on messages on what I've told you. An unsampling is entangled with the problem of uh, collective variable selection. If one, at one attempts uh, computing the free energy as a function of the wrong collective variable, an unsampling doesn't help. Well, there are nowadays powerful approaches to find the correct uh, collective variables and find the correct description in two cases if one knows A and B, and if an ergodic trajectory is available. Hmm? So these approaches are, okay, Markov state modeling and machine learning basis, based approaches, not only ours, but also other approaches be, be, uh, developed by other people. In my opinion, finding the correct collective variables to explore an unknown free energy landscape with many uh, minima is somehow still an open challenge. So here I want to uh, go to uh, acknowledgements uh, because, uh, uh, well, the part of the work which I presented today is actually due to the combined effort of really, really many people. Here I am actually mentioning uh, only a few of them, the one who were actually <laughs> most important for, uh, for me. Of course, Michele Parinello, Francesco Gervasio, Bern Densi, Giovanni Bussi, Christian Micheletti. I would really like to mention all of them, Stefano Piana, Fabio Pietrucci, uh, all of them gave uh, incredibly important contributions and uh, did incredibly uh, important job in this field. Uh, like uh, the last uh, part of the thing that I told you is, uh, well, something, uh, yeah, well, where the contribution of Alex Rodriguez was particularly important and also of uh, uh, Julia Sormani, who did a fantastic uh, job on uh, billing, which I described today. And then I leave uh, as a slide for the discussion, well, uh, some uh, things that I consider some open challenges. These are, of course, not all the possible open challenges in the field, which are far more than what I have listed on this slide, but these are the ones that are, let's say, things on which I am working at the moment or thinking to work at the moment. Of course, I am more than happy to discuss these things over the discussion. Well, thanks very much for your attention. I think I went slightly over time of the 50 minutes which I was allocated for. Thanks very much. Well, going over time is never really a problem at CCAM, as you know, and in particular here. Uh, so thank you, Alessandro, for this really nice talk. We have a question that was actually asked during your presentation, but I would invite Lucio Colombiciacchi to ask it directly since it, was, it came towards the end and felt it was better to wait. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Alessandro. You also partly answered it in the final slides. I was uh, uh, wondering in your example of the folding of the proteins, um, whether the Markov state model analysis would have found the two metastable unfolded states uh, easily, as you have done with your K-analysis. Well, you know, the, pro the problem there is how 
uh, you build the microstates. So the microstates must be built uh, with an approach which is actually a key ingredient of any microstate modeling. Uh, well, I think that if you choose the microstates uh, correctly, then the answer is yes. Uh, how do you choose the microstates correctly? Well, you have to choose, build these microstates using a matrix which uh, is uh, uh, with, which does not imply any information loss. So basically, for example, Paul, in this case, the contact map distance. So if you build your microstates with uh, uh, K means or K medoids, uh, using the contact uh, map distance, I think you would find these two metastable states. Okay, well, thank you, Lucio, for asking the first question. I would invite members of uh, participants to this session to, to just let me know uh, by typing, I would like to ask a question in the Q&A, uh, who wants to ask next? In the meantime, I'm going to ask a question that, that Alessandro, you, ah, we have a question for Mark Tapperman, so go Mark. Yeah, that's cool. You can actually make the little unmute button appear. That's that's really neat. Hey, Alessandro, it's good to see oh, you. Oh, Mark. Uh, I, <laughs> it's been a while. Um, so I think I really like this work on the intrinsic dimension and the way you've done the uh, um, the CV free analysis of the of the free energy. So what I was wondering is if you could extend the range of geometric properties of a data manifold that you could explore beyond say global dimension, if you were looked in some kind of intrinsic curvature or something like this, if you could actually get information about the relevant variables in this intrinsic dimension that you're yeah. finding. So it wouldn't just be that you know it's in a, a space of intrinsic dimension 12 or whatever, but you'd actually have some information about the pathways and therefore maybe even the variables that take you between the various states. Yeah, well, the, this is uh, actually, well, there are a few things that uh, we, um, well, in a way where we have made already some small advance and uh, uh, for example, uh, the intrinsic dimension, well, uh, is not necessarily constant over your manifold. And then we have found a manner to quantify if this intrinsic dimension is varying. Yeah. But, uh, and then one thing on which we would like to work on is also characterizing the topography of the embedding manifold. So something like seeing where there are these uh, a point where different manifold meet, we can somehow infer indirectly if the manifold is curved or not. Uh, well, by, for example, doing local linear embedding and comparing, uh, well, here, so there are, if you use a linear method and the linear method doesn't provide you a gap, then this means that your manifold is not uh, uh, isomorphic to an hyperplane. An open issue on which uh, I am really, really interested to work. I have some ideas, uh, but uh, well, this is st really still ongoing is actually in this slide that we have now on the screen. So one would like to, in a way, to have uh, an explainable free energy landscape where basically you obtain an explicit uh, characterization of this manifold in terms of uh, uh, variables which you can interpret. No, so we have a, of this. My impression is that uh, it will be very difficult to, to find this thing globally, but uh, uh, of course you can imagine to do it locally. And uh, uh, and well, there are many. Well, there are possible manners of doing that. In this moment, in my group, we are exploring. Uh, approaches based on metric learning, which actually might allow to, in a way, select a metric in an explainable collective variable space, which uh, is uh, actually a good uh, local metric on your manifold. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are many, many manners of doing that. This is a very, very important open problem for sure. 
Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Michele Ceriotti. Uh, thank, oh, I need to unmute. Yeah, I, I'm unmuted. Thank you uh, very much, Ale. Fantastic, uh, really, really fantastic talk uh, covering so many aspects of this incredibly difficult problem. So uh, one aspect uh, um, that I would like to hear your opinion on is uh, uh, if you, even if you manage to get something which is like a high dimensional, uh, and, and you sort of already alluded to this, but I would like to hear more. So even if you manage to build a truly high dimensional sampling scheme or uh, sample manifolds that are high dimensional and locally linear, uh, at a certain point, uh, you face the difficulty of sort of uh, understanding and visualizing this uh, uh, stuff. So what do you think would be the best uh, approach for that? Something a la uh, David Wales uh, or? Somehow, yes. In the sense that what we are typically doing is, uh, is uh, basically visualizing uh, so this is something which you can do if your system is metastable, no? If your system is metastable, somehow what, uh, well, nothing else matters in that case uh, applies to uh, free energy minima, set all points. And then basically if, uh, if you really care only about, uh, let's say, kinetic uh, attractors, so whatever they are, you basically easily can turn your system, even if it is very, very complicated, into a, a, a graph, including relatively few nodes, which you can then visualize, uh, well, for example, using David Wales uh, tools or, or even tools developed in the framework of Marco state modeling, of course. So Clearly it's more visualizing a many, so the other thing, how do you visualize a, a funnel in 11 dimension? Well, you simply cannot do it because if you project it, it will not be a funnel anymore. You will immediately, mm -hmm. if you project it in three dimension, you will have a beautiful free energy minimum in your, in your un unfolded state. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's more a network of, the, is, you, visualize it more in terms of discretizing it. Yeah, I don't think there is any, so you have to provide on one hand, let's say qualitative information on the structure of, of your manifold. And of course the intrinsic dimension is one of the things you can say. I am, my dream is also being able to provide information about the topology of the man, manifold, no? Uh, but these are, okay, qualitative information. And then if you then say, okay, then I have a probability density or a free energy defined on this manifold in this probability density, I characterize it, uh, yeah, looking at free energy minima uh, and set all points, uh, yeah, following once again things that have already been done many times by other people, by the way. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Next question, Bernd Ensig. Hi, Bernd. <laughs> so many people. Hi, uh, hi, hi, Alessandro. Um, I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So uh, again, also, yeah. Thanks, man. That was really beautiful overview and um, very cool stuff you're you're doing always, actually. Um, so I, I have a question, also maybe yeah, a follow up on on also you know Mark's question about this dimensionality, which I find really fascinating, right? You, so you're, you, have, you, you have this methodology and you say, you know, so the dimensionality of your problem is, is 12, but you're, you're not sure, you know, what dimensions those are. It's a little bit, reminds me a little bit of deep thought telling us, you know, the answer to the question of everything is 42, but, um, you know, then, then, okay, what then, you know, what do you do with this 42? So on, so on, I was, so I'm gonna, I wanna ask you a little bit about how important is it to know that number or this quantity? And especially because you could imagine doing, you know, um, TPS or, or, or even uh, high temperature sort of simulations where you just have paths that go from A to B and then using, you know, maybe string like methods where, where you have a path that where you just walk along some nonlinear 
curve from A to B, always thinking, hey, I'm in, moving in 1D. Okay, it's a strange nonlinear thing, but hey, it, it's, I'm going, you know, I have a progress variable, a one dimensional, a scalar that tells me, you know, zero, I'm in A and one, I'm yeah, in yeah. B. No, so these... what, what do I really need to know that dimensionality is 12? What does that really mean? Well, okay, so let's say that technically speaking, you need to know this intrinsic dimension to compute what we call the intrinsic free energy. So because if you don't know the dimension of the manifold, which contains, which is the support to your probability density, it doesn't make sense to estimate it. So this is the reason why we need it. Then the thing is the following, that look at uh, uh, the protein folding problem. No, so the protein folding problem, uh, of course, uh, if you know A and B, and uh, well, then, then, then yes, uh, then there are approaches which allow you to sample extremely efficiently the folding transition. And you can say that your uh, system is, uh, one dimensional, no? But on the other hand, uh, so there was another large community of people which are basically, uh, well, you know, the, uh, the community of people, well, say pioneered by Onuchik, uh, Voliness, and so on, with the, the folding uh, landscape, uh, the folding landscape uh, uh, scenario, which was, uh, well, developed originally, well, let's say, as a a, a, an abstract object uh, which was uh, in a way describing very nicely what uh, a, a Go model was doing, like a, a very coarse grain model was doing. No, so yeah. actually looking at the free energy in its full dimensionality, like we are doing, is uh, uh, well, let's say looking at this funnel. No, so saying this funnel is exactly this thing, so it's a complementary manner of looking at your molecular system, which is not that it is better to look at this funnel or looking at a one dimensional coordinate. So they, they are both important to understand what your system is doing. Our free energy is, let's say, a free energy, which does really not imply any significant dimensional reduction. It's like saying that I have only uh, so I, I have no entropy, let's say. Hmm? And so it's like an efficacious potential energy sur surface on the embedding manifold. It's simply a different manner of looking at what your data look like. Thanks, man. Thanks very much. Okay, the next question is from Ron Elber. Hi, so... Hi, Ron. Ron. As always. Uh, uh, sort of a more philosophical questions. In, in some sense, the much successful machine learning relies on, uh, on, on uh, deep learning and all this kind of fancy stuff. They rely on huge amount of data typically. So you're using these short trajectories. You're not using a trajectory that is running on your laptop or something like that. And in some way, we know that uh, human learning is, is less accurate, but is significantly more efficient. We can learn from a much smaller numbers of examples compared to machine learning like uh, that uh, are now available. So the, there are some people that are researching this. And the question is, if you thought about, maybe we should re really do the learning in a different way and try to find method that could use significantly less data to go forward with uh, a trying to predict states rather than trying to get it extremely accurate with a huge amount of data, we can use a lot less data and still get just reasonable results. Well, I definitely agree. And let me be a little bit more, well, in a say, uh, provocative against exactly what, so my own statement. So what I have shown you uh, today in the last part of the talk is, uh, well, scientifically speaking, uh, a little bit useless in the sense that, uh, well, uh, as uh, there was also a comment, uh, I don't remember from who, but clearly, well, of course you can do the same stuff with other approaches, for example, Markov state modeling, no? And in order to do that, uh, 
I need to start from a trajectory which I am not able to generate myself. So actually, the, the challenge here, I don't know if you can still see my pointer. It is a challenge on which I'm actually working actively in this moment is, uh, but it's still a challenge. So I don't have any real result to show you. Uh, it's something on which I am working is exactly this, namely, uh, namely trying to reconstruct this uh, full embedding manifold instead of, uh, so by enhanced sampling, no? So this thing, uh, uh, here I, I uh, so this is like a, a, a program, enhanced sampling in the embedding manifold. Here, uh, so once again, I have to say that there are already attempts in the literature of doing uh, something like that. These attempts, uh, the ones I know are, for example, based on diffusion map, I remember work by Cecilia Clementi. Here, uh, we are also trying something which goes in a way in that direction. So the final goal would be, would be, uh, would be uh, in a way attempting to build uh, this full uh, data landscape by much less measurements. Of course, if your system is meta stable, this must be possible, no? Because it is uh, crazy to imagine to use uh, uh, unbiased sampling for reconstructing a free energy landscape where you have meta stability, no? So here the thing is, this is actually a, a, a very very important uh, line of uh, research, uh, reducing reducing dramatically the number of data that you need to reconstruct these landscapes. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Let's move to Antonio Di Carlo's question. I would say that this is the last question on the list and also the last that I would ask you to, to post at the moment. Uh, always remember, for those of you who stay with us in the second part of this session on the Gather Town meeting, you will have uh, opportunities to exchange even more with our speakers. So Antonio, go. Hi, Alessandro. Hello, Antonio. I have a very short question to finish up. Could the uh, intrinsic dimension Dimension be fractional, yes. non integer. I mean, well, in fact, our estimator, which is uh, we can do it either with maximum likelihood or with the Bayesian estimator, actually never gives us an integer number. Always we get uh, always a, a real number with uh, a confidence interval. So, this thing, uh, this is because uh, finally. And moreover, if I would actually show you a graph where I show you the intrinsic dimension as a function of the scale, you, you will never see something which is really constant. This would be, this can happen only in toy models, no? So you basically have something which looks like a plateau, and then you say, more or less, my dimension is 12, hmm? or more or less, my dimension is 4. Hmm? But, uh, well, actually, if you really fix your scale, let's say, to, I don't know, 5 Armstrong, then you will find an intrinsic dimension of, I don't know, 3.6. Hmm. Okay. What does this in practice mean? Well, this is like the, uh, the black underwear, which I have shown on one of my slides. Okay, thanks. Okay, and I think we should stop the investigation there for um, censorship reasons at the moment. <laughs> thank you very much, Alessandro, for this wonderful talk and thank to all the participants who have asked questions. I think we are ready to move to the second talk of the day. This is going to be presented by Matei Badin, who is uh, working at CISA and Comenius University, and who will discuss for us nucleating different coordination in crystal under pressure, a study of B1, B2 transitions by metadynamics. Matei, if you um, activate your camera and get ready to share your screen. Okay, good. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Alessandro for very nice talk and also thank all the organizers for this very nice opportunity to today present the work of me and one of my advisors being Roman Martiniak at the Common News University about the application of the metadynamics 
in context of the solid to solid phase transition being first order, which employed the change of the coordination. And in order to, to demonstrate the applicability of our new scheme, which is presented in this preprint already, we are going to study a phase transition which involves uh, the, the change of the structure from the rock salt to the cesium chloride-like structure in kitchen salt. And maybe a bit strangely, let me start by some insights of the high pressure chemistry and the structural phase or the phase transition because they are very important in, as Alessandro said, uh, for the choice of the collective variables which we have made in our method. And not surprisingly, what high pressure chemistry tell us is that upon application of the pressure, there is increased coordination of every atom in the structure within first coordination sphere. And what structural first order phase transition in solid tell us, despite they are very simple by means of their thermodynamic description, because there is um, abrupt change of the volumes or some densification happening, they are bond breaking and reconstructive, excuse me, that makes the analysis by means of how the structure itself changes kind of a bit more complex than the structural phase transition of the second order, when there is often a group and group subgroup relation, but this not has to be necessarily the case for the first order phase transition. Also, what, what is generally known, but I would like to stress that, that we should be always eager to look for a method which can calculate that's the Gibbs free energy barriers, because the knowledge of the free energy minima is not enough, in, especially in this uh, context of the solid to solid phase transition. Uh, let me put it very simply. I imagine that we prepare a state in the metastable state E, but the, this upon at a given temperature and pressure, this state would not proceed to the most optimal one, but rather to the to to probably to some state to which the the barrier or the free energy barrier is the lowest and which can be activated by the thermal fluctuations. So it could be the case that we sometimes won't proceed to the most optimal state. To give you a more concrete example of this phenomenon, let's think about the compression and then the decompression scheme of the silicon. So let's think that we, we prepare at ambient pressure a stable cubic diamond phase of a silicon, compress it to the 11 gigapascals, we would find a stable beta thin phase. However, upon decompression, we will not return to the, to the state from which we have started, but rather to a metastable BC, so-called BC8 phase. And this is precisely due to this phenomenon, which I have in a cartoonish manner uh, mentioned at the slide before. So there are some plenty of the open question in the, in the area of the solid to solid phase transition. And that's not only how, what are those Gibbs free energy values, but maybe more interestingly, what does actually the transition mechanism look like what does the nucleation of the solid to solid transition look like? And when we are being able to answer those first three questions, then we can more interestingly think about some interesting physics. And we can ask about what's the role of non-hydrostatic non stress, what's the role of some defects being topological ones like these locations, what is the role of the anisotropy and so on and so on. So this should motivate why we should look at this. And in order to demonstrate the applicability method, we are going to look at this phase transition. So we are going to change the rock salt structure of the kitchen salt, which has where every ion has a coordination six, and we, in which upon application of around 30 gigapascal changes its structure uh, so that every ion has a uh, as coordination of the eight. And this P2 phase is the, is the structure that you would find at ambient pressure for the cesium chloride. This, uh, this phase transition is well known. It was measured by the well-known famous diamond annual cell technique. So basically the thermodynamics is known. And just, just one sentence uh, to describe in one sentence how, how, how we are going to computation model the, this material. We, didn't choice machine learning potential, we use a classical force field, which involves uh, the electrostatic short-range 
poly repulsion and dipole dipole and dipole quadrupole interactions. That's basically the reason for the twofold. First of all, it's cheap. The second is that it allow, allow us to be backward compat compatible what has been done in the past in the literature. Just to remember two things from this slide and the, basically those two numbers that the equilibrium transition pressure for this model is 20 gigapascals and the model instability pressure when basically every point of the lattice or loses its dynamical stability it's at 60 gigapascals. And even though this model is quite well known and it's quite paradigmatic model of the first structural first, first transition between the two solid phases, there, is, there was yet quite a large dispute in the literature. What, how does, uh, or what does the actual uh, microscopic atomistic mechanism look like? So there was a bunch of people who tried to uh, address that question using group theory approaches, identifying common subgroups and some geometric modeling to, um, doing some static DFT calculations. And basically this class can be divided to two subclasses, whether this uh, transition mechanism involves more of the lattice strain or more shuffling of the atoms. Then there was some limited number of the computational studies, some very old one, unbiased molecular dynamics, which basically use overpressurization, which, which, for which you recover this value of the 60 gigapascals and the transition path sampling study uh, uh, by the work of the Zhang and Leon in 2004. And there was also some people who tried to address this question using modified version of the Landau theory. We basically are used to apply Landau theory for a second order phase transition, but they somehow being able to manage to do that also for the first uh, transition. And also, as uh, Alessandro already said a few times, I, I saw some remarks and nice picture. Uh, this, this, this question of the, the trying to simulate solid to solid trace transition has already been uh, addressed by some people from the metadynamics community that being in those references 21 and 22, my advisor, Alessandro Laio and Michele Parinello. And what basically they did, they choose this six order or collective variables, which are the independent components of the supercell matrix. They constrain the supercell estimated, uh, uh, numerically estimated the gradient of the Gibbs free energy as a function of those components in a short MD simulation. And by proceeding and having, having this estimate, they could proceed via, st via st standard discrete metadynamic scheme. However, this scheme being the, being the being the fact that we are biasing the, the global order parameters should or is not suitable for study of nucleation. And as Alessandro already said that uh, we cannot really hope that we would in a, in a very short time, computation time being able to recover the full uh, free energy surface in the six dimension of the coordinates. And also one of the choices why we are interested or be very interested with my advisor to, to use the metadynamics uh, for solid to solid transition was that it was quite recently a quite popular choice in the community of people who try to address liquid to solid transition. So here I've taken without permission a picture from the group of Nikola Panielov and they simulated a crystallization of the silica from a liquid. However, need to say is that the crystallization of a solid from liquid is much easier task physically in terms of description than the crystallization of the solid to solid. And we, we, can, we may address that point in question and answer session. So now just very briefly state what is our method and then say in the second half of my talk, what uh, physical points can we address with our method? So we are employing the coordination number and volume and volume as collective variables. And this is motivated from the very second slide by those insights of the high pressure chemistry and structural first order phase transition. The we are calculating the coordination number for every ion in the lattice by means of this fo uh, following switching function, which has two or the par uh, two three parameters, D0 and R0. And if I 
can uh, get, get your attention now to this picture. So this is um, showing us the radial distribution function of the V1 phase. This is this black solid curve. And we see here the first and the second coordination of shells. So in the first, we have six ions. In the second, we have eight ions. And basically this switching function or this coordination number by means of its absolute value of the derivative. So that's this black dotted line, which need to have a significant overlap between the first and second coordination shell acts as a mediator and can provide the transfer of the two of from those eight ions into the first coordination shell. So then if you would construct a, such a two-dimensional projection of what's happening with your system, you could look at this projection at the, at the, and as axis choose the coordination number of value. And first of all, if you would just start with the unbiased MD in one of those two phases, you would see that the fluctuations around uh, the minima is, are highly anisotropic. So we use um, a covariance metric of these fluctuations to, to, to rotate and they are eigenvalues, eigenvectors to rotate and scale the these original co collective variables just be, by means of this rotation, and this allows us to to better sample or uh, this transition in this CV space along this uh, direction of the structural change, which is this one. So now, having introduced the method, we can move on to the second part of my talk and. Let's let's demonstrate and let's see what we can address or tell about the solid, a first order solid to solid phase transition. So obviously we can reconstruct the free energy profile, and uh, we can we can reconstruct the value of the barrier, find the second phase, and we we can go from the one basin into the other one. And let me just state some genetic properties of our scheme, and that's namely being that we don't have any assumption on the transition mechanism nor on the transition state. And it could be used in the cases when the final state can be unknown. Or, and your only assumption is the change of the coordination or, change, or, or together with the change of the volume. Now, what is possibly more interesting, we can also reconstruct actually the transition mechanism. So on the left, we, we see a almost perfect lattice of the sodium chloride in E1 phase when every atom is blue, so it has coordination of six. Now on the right, we have seen the, the, the same uh, sodium chloride and the same supercell. However, already in the B2 phase, when every atom has a coordination of the eight, so it's being red. And what's very interesting is, first of all, that we, we recovered the so-called uh, modified Burgers mechanism. And this modified Burgers mechanism involves some creation of intermediate layers of she sheared Burr 33 phase. And uh, let me just mention, I'll stress that there is no information about this Burr 33 phase. So it means that this scheme is quite robust and actually can correctly tell us that the correct mechanism, as it is as it was found in, in literature in the past, is has to do something with this B33 phase if we see a collective mechanism. However, we cannot expect that such a collective mechanism would happen at a in thermodynamic limit, so we can increase the system size. And this is very inter important because if you if you choose very large system then this mechanism, metadynamics on our scheme would start to in, induce some defects, some nuclei would emerge, then they would uh, coalescence back, and there at some point there would be some nucleus. And this nucleus would start to grow up to the point that it touches itself via the periodic boundary condition and then fall into the ba B2 basin would proceed. And the most interesting here is actually here, because you tell us what is the correct physical free energy barrier for the, for the transition from one, one phase to the another one upon the assumption of the homogeneous nucleation. Also, I would like to stress that contrary to, to nucleation from a liquid, in a, if you nucleate a solid in, from a, in another solid in the, the emerging uh, nuclei would in the original parent phase induce 
long range strain fields. And this makes this basically the source point why the, all the analysis of such nucleation is much harder. So now being able to, to observe a transitions at various pressures and various system sizes, we can compare or we can plot the barrier height as a function of the system size. And what we see now is are se several points to which I would like to draw to your attention. So first of all, in small system sizes, we, we basically perfectly recover the, the value or the estimate from the Burgers collective mechanism. So there are those points here. Then there is second point you can notice is that the convergence of the barriers is quite slow in respect to the system size. And it has to do something with this long range uh, strain fields. And, and it's also due to the fact that there is some non-classical nucleation theory involved due to these elastic energies. And what is, what is very important here on this graph is actually the R, or R values of the reconstructed bias, which being on the order of the hundreds of the electron volts, they would basically tell us that this transition cannot proceed via the homogeneous nucleation at, uh, at normal temperature. And I, I would like to just stress that this, these findings is very similar as a finding to some very recent papers. So, so I don't want to say that we re we have reinvented the wheel and because there were already in the past quite a large number of people who pointed in the directions of the heterogeneous nucleation, but this is really uh, undoubtedly the way how you can say that, yes, you need to include or you, you have to uh, consider the defects. And our method also allows to study the nucleation and around the presence of the defects. And now, uh, we can we can focus to the structural transition mechanism at the scale of the individual atoms. So one of the very interesting physical questions you can ask is following. So okay, being uh, imagine that we have computational resources that we can only uh, calculate or simulate the transition in small system sizes. So we would actually always find the collective mechanism. That's we are we are always somehow limited. We cannot really uh, or uh, do the, the thermodynamic limit. So, so the question is as follows. Is it the case that the collective mechanism which we found in the small system is the same as the local mechanism uh, to which the atoms proceed into the emerging phase in the process of creation of the nuclear or growth of the nuclei and so on? And uh, the answer is actually no. And there is something or, which I would which I would like to call as a fallacy of the small system. So before before looking at, let me just mention, or I would like to point your attention to these uh, three three nice pictures, which show us uh, the first and second coordination uh, spheres of this central ion, which is in dark uh, dark blue. Then the first coordination sphere is in dark red, and then these light blue are, have the same charge and this as this, so we are not considering them. And then we have on this large, large cube, eight vortices, which are in this pink or light red. And from those that they con constitute the second coordination sphere of the central atom. And from this second coordination sphere, we, we have to bring two two ions in order to increase the coordination from six to eight. And there are only three possibilities which we can, which we can quantify by the relative angle. And here, just, just to shortly see is that in small system, you would see that all the atoms proceed via the mechanism which correspond to this angle. However, in the, upon approaching the thermodynamic limit, there is actually some system size where this changes. And there, in real nucleation, you would see that th this happens by, by this mechanism. This can be also very nicely seen in these in this, uh, two pictures, I would say, when you could see that in small system sizes, you would find the mechanism uh, in which uh, the wall cube is sheared. However, in the, in the very large system, you would see that the structural local mechanism is such that there's the stop and the, and the bottom layer in respect to the central or the middle la layer are sheared in this zigzag pattern. 
And uh, this basically point us to the question that simulating small system is not enough. And it could be the case that due to the presence of this interface between the original and emerging phase, that there is change of the relative cost of those mechanisms. So simulating just small system, you would, uh, you would vent to the wrong conclusion. And now to conclude my talk, I would make a uh, following for I would like to stress following things. First of all, we point to the direction that the nucleation in non idealized conditions, e.g., including uh, dislocation and other effects, is basically essential. And our method allows us to do so. So we would just start with the structure when there is included dislocation. We clearly point to the need of simulation, simulation of the large land scale, so involvement of the hundred thousands of atoms. And nowadays, this should be easy to satisfy having these machine learning potentials. We show that in this preprint that there is something like the fallacy of small systems. There is there was also a huge research. Uh, research line from the 1960 up to the 2000 of people who tried to create step by step uh, classical field theories for nucleation of the solid to solid transition. They did a pretty, pretty good job, I would say. And this is basically a window how to say whether they predictions for the nucleation pre, uh, precursor patterns. So even before the nucleation appears, there are certain patterns which can be probed in the structure. And this is, I, I believe that our method allow us to point whether or prove or disprove whether they are right or not. And, and lastly, just, just me state that this method could be generalized uh, in the cases for non-hydrostatic pressure, or it can be employed as a crystal structure prediction method. And let me just conclude by giving some acknowledgments. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge one of my advisor prof advisors, Professor Roman Martoniak, being affiliated at the Comenius University in Bratislava in Slovakia. And I, at this point, I would like to also kindly acknowledge the generous support from the CISA, Comenius University and Slovak Research and Development Agency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matej, for this very nice presentation. We have one question waiting for you from Fabio Pietrucci. Fabio, yes, please. Okay, hello. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for the very interesting talk. And uh, and also, also Roman is a friend, so I was glad to see how his work proceeds. Um, I have a question. Now, if I understand you, you use uh, uh, the average, uh, average uh, coordination number yes. as a collective value. So actually, this is still a global order parameter somehow. Yes. In the sense that uh, the larger the system, I guess the more you induce a global transition and, uh, and the more difficult mm -hmm. it is to induce a, a, local, a very localized change in coordination. Yes, that's, yes that's, uh, that's one of the points. I fully agree. And it's, this point is manifested of uh, the width of the barrier in this projection because you need to imagine that the nucleus has some critical critical number of the atoms. And if you increase the system in which you merge these uh, critical nucleus of the atoms, the less is the relative change of the coordination number. However, there is another aspect which I think is very crucial. And that is that how you actually calculate that average. Well, because all, also this is global order parameter, but it's uh, calculated as average of the local coordinations. And, uh, and the, I think this is somehow different in respect how, how the gradient from the bias flows into the system. Because in contrary to the scheme then where you employ just supercell, then you cannot, the, I, I think that in, in, in my mind, in that cartoonish manner, that in, in this case, the gradient could flow into the individual atoms, let's state it in this very metaphysical way. And uh, I think this is the reason why, why we can observe in large system real nucleation. However, yes, you are right. And your point has to do something of, of how you actually choose the width of the Gaussians you need to use. So if I can just complete the... Sorry. Uh, if there is time. So no, thanks. Um, 
a related question is uh, mm-hmm. again in the, in the large system uh, uh, did you maybe you said and I, I missed it but did you try to do some committer analysis or uh, yes uh, okay uh, this is due to the fact that uh, this doesn't <laughs> this 20 minute format does not allow me to to say every detail that we did so if you look uh, for the preprint uh, then then in the supplement material we 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 basically explain how we calculate it or, or what values of the barrier height I plot here. So, so basically, yes, we, in, we perform a binary search for a frame involving uh, some nucleus and this nucleus is growing in some, uh, in some, uh, in some, in some, uh, sorry, in some frames before is smaller and we look uh, and by this binary f- f- frame, we choose every uh, every such uh, frame from this binary search, and then perform a- 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 unbiased molecular dynamics from this frame. And then we and and in that spirit, we find the first frame from which we proceed to the to the to the B two basin. Okay. And thank you. And but basically, this is also manifested in the free energy surface because you could see that uh, as you feel the the free energy surface to some point, then you start to escape, and this is basically. Okay, uh, thanks. I'll, ch- I'll check the preprint. Thank you. And maybe you can also continue the discussion in in the gather uh, to go more in detail. I would like to to stop it here so that then Ron can ask his question. Yeah, so it's, it's again, uh, I mean, you had a, a great talk about Alessandra and, and your talk was also very nice. The, my question is really related to the way I think about metastability. Metastability is really a kinetic state in which it is, doesn't live for very long. Sometimes the thermodynamic is not always the best way of describing it. And what you are uh, identifying it is that it relaxes very, very slowly. So in some sense, the determinations or at least the proof of a metastability should be done via kinetic and about computing explicitly the time scale by, I don't know, think like transition path sampling or something like this, and not necessarily by the free energy. Alessandro already emphasized that the choice of the cost variable can change a lot the barrier height and things like this, and therefore the kinetic implications are not always clear. So I just wonder if you can comment. Yes, uh, I actually this points uh, to the or could be found in the answer to this uh, in the first CCAM workshop and the talk uh, given by the Christopher Delago, if I pronounce his name correctly, and that's basically that it it's it's not the free energy surface which can suffer from wrong choice of the collective variables but rather the transition rates which are somehow invariant however i think there is nothing wrong if you believe that you you calculated or constructed the low dimensional free energy surface correctly and and calculated the right uh, keeps free energy barriers and it's directly related to the to the temperature your system has because if the temp is if it is the case that the temperature or the energetic scale of the temperature is much smaller than by the means of the thousands or i don't this is in kbt units some of the thousands then we cannot really expect that this would this transition proceed uh, even under overpress, overpressurization, excuse me, also in nature. So, so we believe that our uh, choice of the collective variables lead to the potential energy surface and to the, and it fulfills every, every requirement that we can basically distinguish the transition state, distinguish the transition minima, and we vary the parameters, the three parameters in our method, being the parameters of Gaussians, the switching function, and we basically always recovered the values of those barriers. No, I completely agree with you that the free energy can always be defined and sort of a meta sort of a local minimum on the free energy given the set of course variable can always be defined. 
But if you are choosing the course variable incorrectly or you are just unlucky, then- Yes, I agree that if you do out. that unluckily, then you would, uh, you would <laughs> suffer. But, uh, but yeah. uh, um, unfortunately, I, Yes, there was a people who tried to simulate this by means of transition path sampling. But as I said, we are, we, there is, you could look at this, this is a matter of choice. How would you like to view on this problem? And we are thinking about this transition in terms of the free energy, the barriers, and in terms of the, of the, because, because at the end, we want to give us some, 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 let's say, recipe for the experimentalists how 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 they can synthesize those structures and you cannot really expect that the transition would proceed if the high, the free energy barrier is very high so then in this sense i think you can look at this okay i think this is a, a super interesting discussion because one could then move to ideas to test the quality of the collective variables. I guess Fabio hinted at that with the committer analysis and so on and so forth, but maybe it's a discussion that you can continue later. Uh, now we're ready to move to the next two talks. And for that, the chair is going to be Ignacio. So Ignacio, go for it. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon. So now I will continue sharing the, uh, the, the two remaining talks of this first part of the session today. We move now to the third speaker, Eugene Druska from Emory University. He will be talking about benchmarking the accuracy of free energy landscape generated by adaptive sampling strategies. So Eugene, please, now the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I wanna connect to Alessandro's talk and talk about the accuracy of the free energy landscapes for one type of sampling strategies. So Alessandro introduced different sampling types, ones with biased uh, force and ones without bias force. And I wanna limit myself to the ones without biases. Uh, for some uh, certain reasons, uh, I'm gonna introduce later. So, Adaptive sampling, which is just a word for this kind of sampling, which does not use biases in the molecular dynamics, has similar advantages to the bias samplings uh, introduced before. Uh, so we have an ensemble of molecular dynamics uh, trajectories, which can be run efficiently on uh, uh, supercomputers. And then we analyze them and pick new, shorter, relatively short molecular dynamics trajectories to in an iterative fashion until we sample all the interesting areas. For example, the rare transitions, the metastabilities. Uh, so the advantage of this non-biased uh, sampling is that having non-biased molecular dynamics uh, uh, can be done uh, on easier uh, than uh, with biased uh, forces. There are less potential to introduce errors. So hopefully the accuracy uh, can be higher. It doesn't have to be, but we will validate that in the next steps. And once we have this ensemble of uh, shorter trajectories, we can analyze them and get a Boltzmann sample to a free energy landscape out of this. So, at the core of these uh, um, adaptive sampling strategies is usually a Markov state model as introduced before. Uh, so I wanna just very shortly introduce this. Uh, the Markov state model is usually just generated from a relatively low dimensional landscape, usually less than 10 dimensions. And in this place, we will uh, cluster all the configurations into clusters as shown like A, B, C, D. And then we measure the transition probabilities from these um, non-biased molecular dynamics uh, uh, short trajectories. And from this matrix of the transition probabilities, we can get the different eigenvectors and eigenvalues which uh, represent a nonlinear uh, low representation of the uh, protein. Uh, or any kind of system you investigate. So in my uh, study, I will focus, limit myself on proteins, but 
this works with all other uh, systems. Proteins have the advantage that the bigger the protein is, the more complex it is. So it gives a very simple uh, measure how complicated systems the sampling strategies can um, hold or uh, sample. Uh, the Markov state models have another advantage that this ensemble of trajectories is not Boltzmann sampled. Some areas can be more sampled than Boltzmann distribution and some areas less sampled, but the Markov state model only needs the local uh, Boltzmann distribution and it does not need the global Boltzmann distribution of the input data. Uh, of course, the Markov state model needs a relatively low dimensional input. If you take the whole system with uh, maybe thousands of dimension, then this will not work well. Uh, there are different approaches to uh, introduce this dimension induction, and I will not validate this dimension induction. Uh, so the more validated in other literature approach is the TK approach, which is similar to PCA, which was already mentioned in the sense it's a linear. Uh, the difference is that it includes also kinetic information as shown in the equation top left, where we have a covariance. And once you take the eigen, uh, vectors and eigenvalues, the slowest dimension in the linear combination of the input features will show the slow behavior. The disadvantage is, of course, that this is a linear representation. So the free energy landscape can be slightly stretched uh, compared to the optimal um, um, uh, low dimensional representation. And sometimes there are uh, slight uh, jumps in the representation. So for that reason, I also use in my work a uh, deep learning approach to this. The main difference here is that in the middle, there's a neural network which has uh, introduced this nonlinearity. And then we can backpropagate uh, so that the loss, which measures the time scales represented by this uh, dimension induction, is minimal. Um, the advantage of this particular state free reversible vamp net is also that the time lag we can uh, we use when measuring uh, uh, the um, dimension reduction can be reduced. So in the left, in Tika, you see that we have always the coordinates for time and time lag to introduce the kinetic information. So this is the minimum length of the trajectory we have to generate as an ensemble for the Markov state model so that we uh, get the Markov state model in the last step. If this lag is shorter, then we can use shorter trajectories. And of course, with limited computation uh, resources, we can uh, run more trajectories. So that's one advantage of this particular deep learning approach. Uh, so, but I want to focus on the validation of the sampling method itself, less so on the dimension reduction. So I picked four proteins with increasing size from 10 amino acids to 73 amino acids. And I was comparing the free energy landscape generated from this adaptive sampling with ground truth. Ground truth in this case means a non-biased molecular dynamics trajectory from a D-short uh, as mentioned before, and we assume this is close to the ground truth. Of course, the sampling is not infinite. So some of the areas will be only sampled one or twice. So we expect some kind of differences. So let's look at the uh, free energy landscapes. The white stars are the starting points of the adaptive sampling. So that's the no a priori information given. Only information is just random unfolded structure. And then we let uh, the adaptive sampling run. Uh, I also want to mention the dimension reduction is uh, run iteratively. So at the beginning, the dimension reduction will only know what is already sampled, which is the, which does not include the folded state. At the end, hopefully, we have the folded state, which we want to uh, reach for these uh, proteins. Uh, in every time um, there's an arrow for the folded state, you see always the unfolded and unfolded minimum in these uh, TICA dimension reductions. And for Shinolin, we see that the black lines, which are the areas which is uh, sampled by adaptive sampling, is pretty well matching with the um, color back background, which is the uh, ground truth. For Villain on top uh, right, 
we see that on the right area, there is some, uh, some area of the free energy landscape which is not sampled by additive sampling. This area has a low probability since the free energy landscape, uh, free energy values here are higher. And looking at the ground truth, this area is only sampled once or twice. So this, this is a difference which can be under, uh, understood as a statistical uh, noise, uh, but we will look at this further. The bigger proteins have uh, show similar uh, results that the lower uh, parts of the free energy landscape are sampled well, but at the higher uh, parts of the free energy, they're not sampled. There are some differences. Of course, that's the, the overlap of the free energy landscape is not, not the only thing we want to validate. Here, I plot the fraction of the population we explore, uh, and the red lines are the adaptive sampling, and the and blue lines are the for plain MD, no adaptive sampling, just the same parallelization, same other parameters, but without the sampling. And we see that every time the full state is found uh, earlier, which is the vertical lines, uh, except for AD3, where the plain MD did not even fold because it's uh, much slower and the computation resources uh, run out. Uh, and we also see the explored uh, population is usually higher for the adaptive sampling with the exception at the end where already the full estate is already um, explored. And this is explained that uh, this particle sampling strategy is optimized to find the full estate. Once it uh, finds that, it's not particularly interested to explore all the high uh, free energy um, configurations. So it depends on your goal the, you have to choose different sampling strategies. But you also see the challenge here, running molecular dynamics to fold or uh, bigger systems takes a lot of computation power. So the statistics here is only four systems. And we see that across the literature, having a validation across a larger benchmark is pretty much impossible due to the computation resources required. So here I continue with a different approach which allows us to reach higher statistics. And the higher statistics can be generated with Markov chain trajectories. So instead of generating unbiased molecular dynamics for each step again and again for different strategies, we can just go to the Markov state model and extract the transition probabilities and use that in a combination with the sampling uh, to simulate how the sampling would work. So that, of course, assumes our Markov state model is very accurate. So we already have to have a ground truth, which we used from the Dishaw um, um, trajectories. And in iterative fashion, we pick from the sampling strategies the restart states, and then we run a Markov state uh, step, a Markov chain trajectory of the appropriate length, and repeat that until the whole sampling strategy is finished. And then we can repeat that because it does not take a lot of computational resources hundreds uh, of times and get some uh, decent statistics out of this. So the proteins here are from the Dichon. They are ranged all the way to 80 amino acids. Uh, and the main advantage is here, we can compare the sampling strategies. I picked a couple which are more popular here. One example is the one over C strategy, which is uh, when we have the Markov state model, the lower uh, visited clusters are probably not sampled well. So we just start new uh, short trajectories in these uh, clusters. So the restart probability will be inverse to the count in each uh, cluster. That's just one of the strategies I investigated. Another strategy is one which includes kinetic information. So the clusters from the Markov state model, which can be have thousands of uh, clusters are clustered kinetically. So hopefully uh, clusters which are uh, states which are kinetically close will be treated uh, together. Again, the pr restart probability is inverse to the macro states, the kinetically connected states. And there are a couple of uh, variation on that I was studying, including a correction for non-equilibrium uh, uh, sampling uh, for the dimension reduction. And here, I want to show the results of this Markov chain trajectory uh, results. 
So in each at the bottom and the X axis, you see different uh, strategies. MD is just plain MD at the same parallelization, which is 50 in the parallel trajectories. Uh, and for different proteins, you see that the number of iterations required to fold is different for different uh, strategies. And there is also significant variation. So for example, for plain MD, the error bar is half the size of the number of steps. So if you rerun the sampling strategy, you can be lucky or unlucky, and the difference is significant in the number of computation resources required. The second strategy on the left is one over C, this uh, clustering and without kinetic information. And here we see there's no advantage in average, but if we include the kinetic information, the third and fourth uh, strategies, they are faster at least by roughly a factor of two for this small protein. If we look at the right side, the proteins are bigger and the speed up can be uh, larger, but I will um, investigate that in detail later. When we look uh, to the right, the QF and QF and N strategies are strategies where we already know uh, the um, collective variable uh, in the sense that in which direction we should push. So the restarting probability is higher there. And we see the time to fold the number of iterations is lower there. So if you pick the collective variable uh, well, then it can speed up. Um, there are different variations of the sa sampling strategies, but I can discuss that later in the poster session. Here, I want to also discuss uh, different goals of the the sampling um, strategies. Before I showed the folding of the system, but you can also want to explore the whole landscape uh, independently if, of finding the global minimas. And here we see that the sampling strategies have a different order. So for example, the one over C strategy is much better in this case than before. And we see that the other strategies can be much slower and in certain uh, cases, even worse than plain MD. Um, so for example, on the bottom right, we see that two of the strategies which had the correction for non-equilibrium input data as, uh, as for the case for adverse sampling kind of get stuck because they are optimized to fold the system to reach the global minimum. But once they uh, find the global minimum, they don't explore all the uh, states. So we see that clearly that they take a, a roughly five times longer to find almost all states. So that's the caveat here. Um, so as a short summary of the two slides, I want to just say that for different proteins, the exact time to find all the states varies. And some strategies are good across all um, use cases I, I, I tested, like the one over C uh, macro strategies without the um, non-equilibrium correction, um, but some strategies can um, be pretty bad. Continuing, I want to compare if the speed up is uniform across the different proteins. So I compared the different uh, um, proteins from the DSHAW and the speed up for the different strategies increases with the mean first passage time. So these proteins are kind of small. So once we go to uh, bigger proteins, we can extrapolate that the speed up could be even larger, larger than four times or 10 times. On the left, you see uh, the adaptive sampling strategy, uh, which is um, for no a priori information on the right side with the um, collective variable. And we see with collective variable pushing in the right direction, the speed up is significantly higher. But there's the, always the question, like what's the maximum speed up we can reach with any kind of sampling? And for that, I developed a, a recursive uh, um, um, approximation, which just gives the upper limit. So this is not the real strategy you can use to um, um, sample uh, unknown system, but it only gives you the upper limit what's possible with this kind of non-biased uh, sampling, which includes Markov state models. At the bottom, I included the recursive relationship, 
which uh, basically just orders all the possible states in the Markov state model by the time which is um, uh, it needs uh, to reach the folded state and it only will accept um, restarting positions which are optimal from the already explored states. And uh, the, I can explain the recursive relation later in the poster session. With this, we get another uh, value, which is like the upper limit. And there's still noise because this uh, Markov state uh, sampling includes a uh, randomness. So we see at the bottom left, the upper limit, which is much higher than the previous uh, shown uh, sampling strategies. Um, so the upper limit for the larger proteins is like 15 times compared to plain MD. And it still extrapolates for larger protein and increasing, but for tiny, uh, small proteins, the speed up can be only maybe 50% or uh, smaller, but uh, it just shows that the sampling strategies could be improved but the improvement could uh, is not like massive. The improvement could be a factor two or three, but it's not not higher. Um, until now, I was uh, comparing the and validating the results of the sampling strategies in the static sense. So all kinds of ensembles of static structures or even the free energy are a static representation of the uh, system but we can also be interested in the dynamical, the kinetical information of the system shown on the right in as the transition probabilities and transition times uh, for the system. And this kind of kinetic information is harder to obtain since you first have to obtain the static information and then only when you can investigate the dynamics. So I did investigate the kinetics also in as validation of these sampling strategies uh, so we have the ground truth, which are the black dashed lines for the unfolding mean first passage time for the four, as you remember, four systems with increasing size. And the blue lines are just no sampling, just plain MD. And the red lines are adaptive sampling. So we observe that after a while, uh, the both uh, plain and adaptive sampling reach uh, the accurate values. Uh, the y-axis is in logarithmic, so the accuracy is not super precise, and, and improving the sampling strategies could increase the accuracy in the kinetic sense. Uh, you also see that for certain systems like the Shinolin, the adaptive sampling has a larger error than the, the plain MD, for the simple reason that the sampling strategies are not optimized for the kinetic sampling. They're optimized to reach the folded state first. Uh, so, and they don't add uh, statistical information once the transition region is crossed. So the transition regions are uh, essential for accurate kinetics. Um, but for some proteins, we have higher uh, accuracy and in general adaptive sampling reaches uh, good accuracy for plain MD due to the speed up effect. Um, the A3D of course, since plain MD was not able to fold due to limited computation resources, there's no comparison, but adaptive sampling reached uh, the correct unfolding mean first passage time. Uh, as another point, as mentioned by Alessandro, is that all these sampling strategies are mostly useful only when we can actually execute them on a computer. Uh, so one essential part of that is the scalability of these algorithms. And here I compared with the Markov chain trajectory approach, how fast it can uh, fold uh, these systems with the different parallelization. We know supercomputers, we can uh, run thousands or even more trajectories independently, but will these algorithms actually take good advantage of this parallelization? And on the left, you uh, see the absolute folding time, which is proportional to the time, real time you need. And we see red, the uh, plain MD, and all other uh, sampling strategies are in different colors. And we see plain MD has a lower scalability than the sampling strategies for the reason that uh, sa adaptive sampling communicates, they exchange information, but plain MD are independent trajectories and they don't uh, share information. Um, the adaptive sampling scales to roughly 100 or 1,000 independent parallel trajectories. 
and the scalability is higher for larger proteins. For small proteins, um, par uh, paralyzation below 100 is optimal. For larger proteins, up to 1,000 is good. On the right is the total folding time, which is the cumulative uh, trajectory length uh, used. And we see above 100, the, we are wasting uh, computation resources. So that's um, not a good choice when you have, um, when you execute this uh, sampling uh, strategies. We also see that uh, the red line, the plane MD, uh, has waste um, scales uh, worse. Of course, this algorithmic scaling is only useful if the software can execute this on a scalable fashion. So I implemented um, a scalable um, software, which runs up to uh, 2,000 GPUs uh, in a scalable fashion. One essential step of that was uh, asynchronous execution, because we have an iterative fashion of running MD and analysis. And during the analysis, the MDs are um, there all the GPUs are not doing anything. They are waiting for the result of analysis. With the asynchronous execution, the analysis and MD are happening at the same time. That way, we don't uh, waste computation resources with GPUs waiting for the new uh, tasks. So with all these results, I was giving some kind of validation and benchmarking of the accuracy of different uh, sampling strategies, of course, limited only to non-biased sampling. And I want to give that as a start, uh, additional uh, data point for future work. Uh, I will just point out that the C micro strategies are across the board of the investigated systems, best for finding the global minimum and also uh, looking at the explored uh, population, there's uh, some validation, but some systems will get stuck uh, as shown in the graph up middle. Uh, additional information are available at the papers below, and I will discuss that in the poster session. Of course, all this work is only possible with a lot of collaboration. So especially with uh, Cecilia Clementi, Lydia Karaki, JV Abella, and Shantanuja. Shantanuja is mostly for the software uh, collaboration responsible, or uh, the previous uh, people mentioned for the uh, algorithmic uh, sampling strategies. Um, with that, I want to thank you and open the um, for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Eugene, for this uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, indeed, we now move to the question section, I, I remind you that it's enough that you indicate in the Q&A channel your intention to interest to make a question, and then uh, we will open the mic for you so that then you can directly talk with the speaker. Yeah? So first question is by Ron Albers. So Ron, please. Uh, yeah, so this is really more of a clarification. You talk about the errors. I'm just wondering if, if the model that you're using is a single Markov state model, what could also imagine that you are sampling from a distributions of Markov state model and then you're using many of them? Uh, I only use one uh, Markov state model. Of course, when you have only part of the landscape explored, I will utilize only the part of the Markov state model which is uh, already explored uh, as a ground truth. So for the Markov chain trajectory approach, we the Markov state model information is not directly uh, extracted, but it's only extracted by creating Markov chain trajectories and analyzing these Markov uh, uh, chain trajectories and generating a new temporary Markov state model, which is used to pick which state will be picked next in the adaptive sampling. Uh, sampling. Okay. Um, okay, thank you very much. So we have another question by Jan Michelena. Leon, you can pose the question yourself. If this is your mic is open, if you unmute yourself. Okay. So maybe I can just, uh, since he wrote the question, I can just, uh, yeah, it says that the mic does not work. So question says, do you think 
recent sampling strategies based on machine learning like fast or adaptive bandit are better than oh, sorry are better than the ones you propose throughout the talk it's a question about whether this machine learning will sort of like change the landscape uh, with respect to what you were presenting um so i think these kind of sampling strategies need to be first validated compared and for that uh, i think there's no accurate validation done yet um at least um I haven't seen uh, one. So it's possible that machine learning can ex uh, extract some additional information out of the information already given. Uh, so it's possible, but there's a lot of unknown information, unknown unknowns and known unknowns. So uh, I currently, I don't know one which is better than the currently uh, tested uh, systems, but it's possible we will uh, find new one so as i sh shown the upper limit there is a, a gap of three times roughly where the currently sampling strategy could be speed up so it's definitely an opportunity for improvement yeah. thank you then there is uh, an additional question by karsten harman uh, yeah thank you very much for this very careful uh, study that you conducted i was wondering whether the results also tell you something about where one could improve adaptive sampling methods. So does it give you some hints what could be changed, for example? I know this um, is a general question, but I mean, this could, could be relevant, I guess. So, okay, so one big part which could be improved is the kinetic. I mentioned the kinetic results and that most of the sampling strategies are not optimized for that. So if the kinetic results are relevant, and there's a big uh, opportunity to improve the sampling strategies, uh, mostly for that part. As far for uh, static information, uh, there's possible. Uh, the challenge is that for each system, the landscape looks differently, different uh, dimensionality, and so on. So any sampling strategy has to be robust and cannot be get stuck in some kind of uh, uh, spurious minima. Uh, so I think the robustness has to be always validated, but I don't have uh, specific ideas uh, how to improve that, uh, which I'm ready to uh, discuss here. Okay, thanks. I mean, just as a side remark, I mean, I was wondering whether you could distinguish, uh, say, more invasive methods from less invasive methods, and you see this in the sense that they that the more invasive methods uh, have problems with reproducing the kinetics or so? Uh, yeah, so I showed two, uh, for one um, system where two sampling strategies were much slower than even plane and uh, molecular dynamics. So these uh, strategies were like optimized to do additional correction step for the non-equilibrium uh, ensemble of input data. As, and for this particular system, they slow down. So this has to be definitely validated. And it's true that certain sampling strategies have a challenge with working well for some systems, but not well for other systems, at least in the automatic fashion. So all the sampling strategies here investigated uh, were like automatic, so no human uh, correction during the sampling to allow a good comparison. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. I think, uh, as you have mentioned, Eugene, there is uh, also time during the poster session afterwards to take some of these discussions and uh, continue them in more depth. I think we should move to the last speaker of this first uh, part of the event, and that will be Isabel Louise Grothaus from the University of Bremen, who will be talking about N glycan conformers explored by enhanced sampling and machine learning. So, please, uh, Isabel, now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And I would also first like to thank the organizers for setting up such a nice uh, meeting opportunity. Um, I am a second year PhD, PhD student uh, in the group of Lucio Colombiciaki at the University of Bremen. And we are also collaborating uh, in this project with Giovanni Bossi from uh, CISA. Uh, so I'm working on N-glycans. 
And N-glycans are actually uh, polysaccharide structures which have a diverse setup. I represent here two different um, conformations. And uh, each of these boxes and circles are different monosaccharides. And so they are called N-glycans because they are attached to the asparagine residue in the polypeptide chain. So they are post-transnational modifications. And probably the most recent famous example is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, where on the left, you see the protein without glycans. And on the right, you have the native structure where N-glycans are attached. And each of these blobs correspond to one N-glycan where the conformations are recorded over the trajectory. And you already see that they span quite a huge uh, space of the protein surface. Um, so N-glycans only occur in eukaryotic cells and uh, they are attached to the polypeptide chain after the translation and there's always one precursor. But importantly, um, this N-glycan is trimmed by several enzymatic steps in the ER and in the Golgi. And basically after each step, the processing of the glycan could stop or you can also end up with very complex structures. And um, yeah, this whole process basically gives a high diversity of different N-glycan structures. Um, the flexibility, no, sorry, the diversity of the N-glycans itself are arising because of different levels of complexity. So the first one is um, the composition of the glycan based on which different monomers um, are present, so which different monosaccharides. Um, then as a second level, you have different modifications of these monosaccharides, for example, by N-acetyl or n groups, which actually give rise then to new monosaccharides. Um, the third level of complexity is given by how the different monosaccharides are then linked, because each um, carbon atom in this cyclic ring structure can actually build a glycosidic bond, and this is giving you a lot of different combinations. And as, as a last level, um, you have the branching, as specific monosaccharides can build so-called junctions, from which not only one um, monosaccharide chain can then originate, but several ones. And N-glycans are so important because they occur for over 50% of eukaryotic proteins and are mostly um, still ignored in studying um, protein characteristics. Although N-glycans have um, an influence on the protein folding and stability, they also regulate um, the protein structure and also the function of the protein. And are also because they are decorated on the surface are targets for lectins and antibodies. In our study, we use three model systems, which are of the type of high minus type N-glycans. Um, you can see them here on the left, and they differ between, for example, here you have one focus residue attached, or you have a larger high minus um, chain. And these systems are characterized by multiple degrees of freedom. Basically, they have two features. The first one is the ring puckering. Um, so you have a distortion of the monosaccharide cyclic ring from a chair conformation to a boat conformation and back to a chair. And this can be described by the feature angle um, spanning these different um, conformations. And this can occur for each monosaccharide. Then you have the linkage of the different um, monosaccharides by the glycosidic um, angles, and they are characterized by mostly um, two torsional angles, phi and psi. Whereas if you have the specific case where the linkage is done between a C1 and a C6 um, carbon atom, you have an additional angle omega, uh, which is here marked in pink stars. And um, giving these um, multiple degrees of freedom, um, you end up with highly flexible polymers and the movement of N-glycans can be best imagined by these sky dancing structures, which are wobbling around with um, the different arms. And the problem is that classical molecular dynamics simulations cannot cover um, these different degrees of freedom. And we also recognize that um, standard visualization techniques also cannot represent these different conformers unambiguously. Um, so the aim in this study is to first um, sufficiently sample the phase space of these different glycans um, by the enhanced sampling method rest which I will present shortly. And then also do visualize these different conformers um, by the sketch map approach, but also um, Alessandro already talked about. And the overall goal in the future is to apply this methodology to um, protein, um, protein, glycoprotein systems um, to also characterize glycans which are attached to proteins. Um, coming to the enhanced sampling method, we are combining two replica exchange methods. 
Uh, first of all, replica exchange with solid scaling, which is best known as REST2, REST2 um, where we have the system of study here in the right, um, and we leave the solvent unscaled, but define the N-glycan as solute, which is then over the replica um, range, um, the Hamiltonian is scaled by this lambda value. Uh, we combine this approach with replica exchange with collective variable tempering. This means that we define uh, quite a high number of collective variables. In our case, all the total angles that are present in the glycan. For this system, it's, for example, 17. And um, you bias these collective variables in each replica. And this is behaving like normal well-tempered metadynamics. And um, importantly, um, this bias is built in a concurrent one-dimensional energy potential for each collective variable. Um, important also is that the bias factor for all the different CV is scaled over the replica um, uh, range. And you can see this here exemplified in the right um, picture. Um, you obtain, therefore, in the ground replica an unbiased simulation and in the highest replica, an ergodic system. And by doing exchanges between these different replicas, you um, obtain a unbiased simulation, which is exploring still all conformers because of the exchanges. Um, from these enhanced sampling simulations, we can obtain the free energy landscapes of our um, characteristic features. First of all, the puckering of the monosaccharides with monosaccharides, which we estimate based on kernel density estimation. And you can see re three representative spectra for different monosaccharides. And uh, these three minima correspond to the different chair, boat, and chair conformation. And what is important here and also a little bit surprising is that for polysaccharides, it's thought that they mostly occur or almost occur in the chair conformation when they are in a chain. However, for specific monosaccharides, we can also observe stable minima in the boat conformation. Secondly, you um, can compute the torsional angles, um, yeah, the free energy of the torsional angles. Um, and here in this graph, I have three representative structures. And the coloring is basically showing the convergence of the bias for these um, CVs. And representative one is the omega angle, which has always three minima, which is also true for all the other torsion, uh, omega angles. And the psi angles always have two minima. And from these torsional angles to describe the conformers now, we construct a conformer string. So we check each um, angle and assign numbers to the different minima. And then we check uh, for each frame in the trajectory, which minima is occupied for each torsional angle. And we record the possible combinations, then ending up with this conformer string, which is uh, in dotted red, where each digit is um, giving basically a torsional angle and the specific number is defining in which minima the system is located. And we are aiming, yeah, we are using this discrete description instead of some density clustering algorithm. We want because we wanted to really make sure to um, cover all the important conformers also separately apart. Once we have the conformer distribution, um, we can compute uh, the probability for these conformers uh, from the different simulations. And we effectively ran uh, two different methods. First, the rest rect method and in combination also classical MD. And both of the methods were run twice um, with different initial conformations um, named GT and GD. And for each Glycan system, we can observe the, the um, conformer distribution. Um, here it's important to recognize that classical MD simulations always have much higher error bars than the rest, rest rect method. And especially for larger glycan systems, you see that also um, the different classical MD simulations started from different conformers end up in significant different uh, conformer probability distributions. Um, this is showing us that our respect method is definitely performing better than classical MD, which is mostly um, used um, still to um, explore these glycan systems. Um, I would also like to note that um, almost five conformers or the first five conformers uh, describe 70% of the phase space that are discovered by the glycans and that the highest variation um, or the difference between these conformers are the different minima of the omega angle. As you can see in the string that mostly the numbers are differing and changing in the omega angles and less in the other ones. 
Um, coming to the machine learning part, um, so as a dimensionality reduction technique, we use the sketch technique, which is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction. And as input features, we are using all torsional angles, which are depending on the system 40 to 22 um, variables. And first of all, um, you have to construct the histogram of pairwise distances between the different frames to then choose your hyperparameters, majorly the switching distance. And um, the constructed sketch map, we colored by different um, distributions. First of all, we checked for the different angle distributions. For example, in the first case, you can see the distribution of the one uh, of the omega one eight angle, where you see a nice um, clustering of different minima to the left and to the right. Um, secondly, also the other, other omega angle in the system is um, clustered well apart, which is the 5-7 angle, where you also see here um, that specific blobs are colored by a specific um, energy minima of this angle. Um, the less recognized angles in the system, for example, here Psi 2-3, which are not varying so much between conformers are still um, mapped to specific um, blobs here in or conformers in this sketch map. And the ideal goal was to see if the different um, found conformers can also be represented by the sketch map and mapped unambiguously apart. Therefore, we introduced a coloring scheme where the green one here corresponds to the um, conformer with the highest occurrence and highest probability and then have the scanning color scheme. And you can see here down in the sketch map um, that all these different colors are mapped nicely apart. Um, so meaning that sketch map is really able to um, su successfully cluster the conformers in part and it is a method to, um, yeah, to be used to um, investigate or represent any lichens. Um, yeah, we, apply, we applied this method to all of our glycan systems. Um, it's, evenly good doing for the smaller glycan systems. For the last one, you could say that, okay, here um, colors are overlapping, meaning that two conformers are clustered together. This is because these conformers, which are here clustered together, do not vary in an omega angle, but rather in a psi angle. Um, also we yeah, are presenting a little bit the limitation of the method um, so far. As a last point, um, we made the observation that the conformer distribution is depending on how single monosaccharides are pucker. So on the left, you have the overall um, conformer distribution as before for the small glycan system. However, when you restrain um, the pucker of the second residue, um, so the CETA, CETA um, uh, variable to a boat conformation, you obtain a different distribution. You could now say that this is looking similar to the left one, but you have to observe that the string ordering changed. And we actually labeled here um, the different um, significant differences between conformer by these numbers. And you can see that, for example, this conformer has now a much higher probability than before when all puckering um, were um, investigated. And this can even be better um, seen in the sketch map. On the left one, you have the original one. And on the right, you have basically the same one, but just colored um, by the different conformer distribution, having theta two as both. And you can see that the coloring is changing which, um, for the different blobs. So you actually have a shift in conformer distribution. Um, how this is of biological relevance, we are not really sure. Um, and this also needs further verification um, when n glycans are bound to the protein, if this effect can still be observed. Um, and with this, I already like to conclude. So the perspectives of this method is it can be used to do interglycan comparison of similar structures, just differing in a few modifications and you could use the um, yeah the common core as a feature and then inv investigate how the conformer population might change because of this additional residue and also apply the methodology to n glycans -glyc um, which are um, attached at different position at the protein and see how their conformer conformational distribution is different um, because of different interactions with the protein um, in the study, we've shown that the RESPECT method is a suitable method to enhance sample glycan system and is also easily applicable because you don't require any pre-knowledge of the system. 
and that the sketch map algorithm is able to represent over the over 70% of the explored conformance apart. Um, that the omega angle is the mostly um, variable um, degree in the system. And that also puckering might be more important for polysaccharides that we, than we might expect so far. And with this, I also would like to thank my groups in Bremen and in Trieste for all the uh, support. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions. I'm also looking forward to seeing you in the poster session. Thank you very much, Isabel, for this uh, nice presentation. Um, now, as uh, for the rest of the talks, we have time for a discussion. You can always post your intention to ask a question through the Q&A channel. So we have one by Karma Rovira. So Karma, if you want to ask the question. Hello, you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, um, nice talk, thank you. You are considering um, distorted sugar conformations, but on, you are considering only both type of conformations. So what about the other type of conformations like half chair, envelope, twisted ball? Um, I, I don't consider like when you say both, you are, you are meaning all of these, all of them. Yes, yeah. In this not, you are not differentiating. No? Exactly. In this case, we are not differentiating. We also check for the um, phi angle of the crema pupil parameters, which the theta angle is actually referring to. Um, there are also um, different minima explored when you look in the phi direction, um, but we, for simplicity, we not, um, just um, yeah, considered now the theta angle, which is then um, yeah, generalizing the whole system a little bit more. But um, it's true that one should also look in the phi direction to also differentiate the different both conformations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I do not see any further questions. Um, since we are running a bit late, I think it's, uh, the, as I mentioned, we will move now to the poster session so you can pick up some of additional questions with uh, Isabel and also with the, the rest of the speakers. So thank you to all of you. All right, so sorry. So as I said, you, you have the previous uh, sessions on our webpage and also through uh, the YouTube channel. And in an, uh, because this is the end of this first uh, series, uh, you will receive uh, an email uh, asking to complete a survey takes a bit of time, we have tried to make it light, but it will be very useful for us to get your feedback in a way to improve the quality of the events and also to adapt them to, to provide a better, a better service. And uh, we are planning already a second series of seminars in the, in the fall, so stay in tune. Uh, actually, uh, you can uh, enroll in our mailing list uh, if you go to the web page. Uh, in our, I mean, the, the mixed gen webpage in the, in the SICAM website, and scroll to the very end down of the page, there is uh, there the possibility if you click to enroll into this uh, mailing list. And also, if you are in Twitter, uh, you can follow at SICAM events where we uh, post regularly uh, the latest news of the different events that we organize. Um, then we come here to, to the end of, of this first part. Uh, I would like now to, for, for the second part, for the Gather, uh, just a couple of technical, a few points. Before joining Gather, ensure you disconnect from Zoom, otherwise you will suffer from echo. Uh, only registered participants can join in Gather. If you are following this session and you have not registered, uh, you can email to the help desk at ccam.org and we can give you access. It's uh, important, I mean, it's preferred if you can use Chrome or Firefox. Uh, Chrome is typically the browser that works better with Gather. And in the web page uh, for, for this MicGen, there is a, a short user guide. You, if you want to have a look and, and how to use Gather in case you don't know it. You can also, if you have problems or questions, email to helpdesk at ccam.org and then they can help you. And also for those of you who are new, if you stay with me for a couple of extra minutes, I can uh, give you a practical tutorial uh, by going to Chrome myself and show you uh, how the session will work. In any case, I, I hope to see you all now in a, in a few minutes in this uh, gather session for the second part of today's event. Thank you very much.
Thank you.